Act One of The Conscious Lovers by Richard Steele. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conscious Lovers. Illogenis narrationis, quod in personis positum est, de betiberi sermones festivitatem, animorum dissimilitudinum, gravitatum, lenitatum spem metum, suspicionum, desiderium, dissimulationum, misericordiam, rerum varietatis, fortunae commutationum, insperatum incommodum, subitam lentitium, jacundum exitum rerum. Cicero, Rhetorica ad Herinium, Liber Unus. Footnote. The kind of narrative which is presented on the stage ought to be marked by gaiety of dialogue, diversity of character, seriousness, tenderness, hope, fear, suspicion, desire, pity, variety of events, changes of fortune, unexpected disaster, sudden joy, and a happy ending. End of footnote. The Conscious Lovers, a comedy which had been long in preparation, was acted at Drury Lane Theatre on November the 7th, 1722, with new scenes and all the characters new dressed, and with Booth, who had acted the part of Pamphilus, the prototype of young Bevel, at Westminster with great success. Wilkes, Myrtle, Sibber, Tom, Mills, Sir John Bevel, Mrs. Oldfield, Indiana, and Mrs. Younger, Phyllis, in the principal parts. The play ran for eighteen nights and was a great success. It was often revived between 1722 and 1760, and was acted at Covent Garden in 1810 and at Bath in 1818. Phyllis was Peg Woffington's second speaking character in Dublin, and she took that part on March 9th, 1741, during her first season in London. The play was published by Thompson on December 1st, 1722, with the date 1723 on the title page. The general idea of the piece is taken from Terence's Andrea, but the original is widely departed from after the opening scenes. Collie Sibber lent material aid in preparing the play for representation. It was attacked by John Dennis in two pamphlets and defended by Benjamin Victor and others. To the King May it please your Majesty, after having aspired to the highest and most laudable ambition, that of following the cause of liberty, I should not have humbly petitioned your majesty for a direction of the theatre had I not believed success in that province and happiness much to be wished by an honest man and highly conducing to the prosperity of the commonwealth. It is in this view I lay before your majesty a comedy which the audience, in justice to themselves, has supported and encouraged and is the prelude of what, by your Majesty's influence and favour, may be attempted in future representations. The imperial mantle, the royal vestment, and the shining diadem are what strike ordinary minds, but your Majesty's native goodness, your passion for justice and her constant assessor mercy, is what continually surrounds you in the view of intelligent spirits, and gives hope to the supplicant, who sees he has more than succeeded in giving your majesty an opportunity of doing good. Our king is above the greatness of royalty, and every act of his will which makes another man happy has ten times more charms in it than one that makes himself appear raised above the condition of others but even this carries unhappiness with it. For calm dominion, equal grandeur, 
and familiar greatness do not easily affect the imagination of the vulgar, who cannot see power but in terror. And as fear moves mean spirits, and love prompts great ones to obey, the insinuations of malcontents are directed accordingly, and the unhappy people are ensnared, from want of reflection, into disrespectful ideas of their gracious and amiable sovereign, and then only begin to apprehend the greatness of their master when they have incurred his displeasure. As your majesty was invited to the throne of a willing people for their own sakes, and has ever enjoyed it with contempt of the ostentation of it, we beseech you to protect us who revere your title as we love your person. Tis to be a savage to be a rebel, and they who have fallen from you have not so much forfeited their allegiance as lost their humanity. And therefore, if it were only to preserve myself from the imputation of being amongst the insensible and abandoned, I would beg permission, in the most public manner possible, to profess myself, with the utmost sincerity and zeal, Sire, Your Majesty's most devoted subject and servant, Richard Steele. The Preface this comedy has been received with universal acceptance, for it was in every part excellently performed, and there needs no other applause of the actors but that they excelled according to the dignity and difficulty of the character they represented. But this great favour done to the work in acting renders the expectation still the greater from the author to keep up the spirit in the representation of the closet or any other circumstance of the reader, whether alone or in company, to which I can only say that it must be remembered a play is to be seen, and is made to be represented with the advantage of action, nor can appear but with half the spirit without it. For the greatest effect of a play in reading is to excite the reader to go and see it, and when he does so, it is then a play has the effect of example and precept. The chief design of this was to be an innocent performance, and the audience have abundantly shown how ready they are to support what is visibly intended that way. Nor do I make any difficulty to acknowledge that the whole was writ for the sake of the scene of the fourth act, wherein Mr. Bevel evades the quarrel with his friend, and hope it may have some effect on the Goths and Vandals that frequent the theatres, or a more polite audience may supply their absence. But this incident, and the case of the father and daughter, are esteemed by some people as no subjects of comedy. But I cannot be of their mind, for anything that has its foundation in happiness and success must be allowed to be the subject of comedy, and sure it must be an improvement of it to introduce a joy too exquisite for laughter that can have no spring but in delight, which is the case of this young lady. I must, therefore, contend that the tears which were shed on that occasion flowed from reason and good sense, and that men ought not to be laughed at for weeping till we are come to a more clear notion of what is to be imputed to the hardness of the head and the softness of the heart. And I think it was very politely said of Mr. Wilkes, to one who told him there was a general weeping for Indiana, I'll warrant he'll fight ne'er the worst for that. To be apt to give way to the impressions of humanity is the excellence of a right disposition and the natural working of a well-turned spirit. But as I have suffered by critics who have got no farther than to inquire whether they ought to be pleased or not, I would willingly find them proper a matter for their employment 
and revive here a song which was omitted for want of a performer and designed for the entertainment of Indiana, Signor Carbonelli, instead of it played on the fiddle. And it is for want of a singer that such advantageous things are said of an instrument which were designed for a voice. The song is the distress of a lovesick maid, and may be a fit entertainment for some small critics to examine whether the passion is just or the distress male or female. 1. From place to place forlorn I go, with downcast eyes a silent shade, forbidden to declare my woe to speak till spoken to, afraid. 2. My inward pangs, my secret grief, my soft consenting looks betray. He loves, but gives me no relief. Why speaks not he who may? It remains to say a word concerning Terence, and I am extremely surprised to find what Mr. Sibber told me prove a truth, that what I valued myself so much upon, the translation of him, should be imputed to me as a reproach. Mr. Sibber's zeal for the work, his care and application in instructing the actors and altering the disposition of the scenes when I was, through sickness, unable to cultivate such things myself, has been a very obliging favour and friendship to me. For this reason, I was very hardly persuaded to throw away Terence's celebrated funeral and take only the bare authority of the young man's character. And how I have worked it into an Englishman and made use of the same circumstances of discovering a daughter when we least hoped for one is humbly submitted to the learned reader. Prologue by Mr. Wellstead Spoken by Mr. Wilkes To win your hearts and to secure your praise The comic writers strive by various ways. By subtle stratagems they act their game And leave untried no avenue to fame. One writes the spouse a beating from his wife And says each stroke was copied from the life. Some fix all wit and humour in grimace and make a livelihood of Pinky's face. Here one gay show and costly habits tries, confiding to the judgment of your eyes. Another smuts his scene, a cunning shaver, sure of the rakes and of the wench's favour. Oft have these arts prevailed, and one may guess if practised or again would find success. But the bold sage, the poet of to-night, by new and desperate rules resolved to write. Fain would he give more just applauses rise, and please by wit that scorns the aids of vice. The praise he seeks from worthier motives springs. Such praise as praise to those that give it brings. Your aid most humbly sought, then, Britons lend, And liberal mirth like liberal men defend. No more let ribaldry with licence writ Usurp the name of eloquence or wit. No more let lawless farce uncensured go The lewd dull gleanings of a Smithfield show. Tis yours with breeding to refine the age, to chasten wit and moralise the stage. Ye modest, wise and good, ye fair, ye brave, to-night the champion of your virtues save. Redeem from long contempt the comic name, and judge politely for your country's fame. Dramatis Personae Sir John Bevel, read by Todd. Mr. Sealand, read by Algy Pug. Bevel, Jr., in love with Indiana, read by Adrian Stevens. Myrtle, in love with Lucinda, 
Read by Adam Bielka. Simberton, a coxcomb. Read by Alan Mapstone. Humphrey, an old servant to Sir John. Read by Larry Wilson. Tom, servant to Bevel Jr. Read by Thomas Peter. Daniel, a country boy, servant to Indiana. Read by Atunismint. Mrs. Sealand, second wife to Sealand. Read by Sonia. Isabella, sister to Sealand. Read by Catherine Phipps. Indiana, Sealand's daughter by his first wife. Read by Rapunzelina. Lucinda, Sealand's daughter by his second wife. Read by Devorah Allen. Phyllis, maid to Lucinda. Read by T.J. Burns. Servant. Read by Lian Yao. Stage directions read by Michael Max. Scene. London. The Conscious Lovers. Act the First. Scene One. Sir John Bevel's House. Enter Sir John Bevel and Humphrey. Have you ordered that I should not be interrupted while I am dressing? Yes, sir. I believe you had something of moment to say to me. Let me see, Humphrey. I think it is now full forty years since I first took thee to be about myself. I thank you, sir. It has been an easy forty years, and I have passed them without much sickness, care, or labor. Thou hast a brave constitution. You are a year or two older than I am, sirrah. You have ever been of that mind, sir. You knave, you know it. I took thee for thy gravity and sobriety in my wild years. Ah, sir, our manners were formed from our different fortunes, not our different age. Wealth gave a loose to your youth, and poverty put a restraint upon mine. Well, Humphrey, you know I have been a kind master to you. I have used you for the ingenuous nature I observed in you from the beginning, more like a humble friend than a servant. I humbly beg you'll be so tender of me as to explain your commands, sir, without any farther preparation. I'll tell thee, then. In the first place, this wedding of my son's, in all probability, shut the door, will never be at all. How, sir? Not to be at all? For what reason is it carried on in appearance? Honest, Humphrey, have patience, and I'll tell thee all in order. I have myself, in some part of my life, lived, indeed, with freedom, but, I hope, without reproach. Now, I thought liberty would be as little injurious to my son. Therefore, as soon as he grew towards man, I indulged him in living after his own manner. I knew not how, otherwise, to judge of his inclination. For what can be concluded from a behavior under restraint and fear? But what charms me above all expression is that my son has never, in the least action, the most distant hint or word, valued himself upon that great estate of his mother's, which, according to our marriage settlement, he has had ever since he came to age. No, sir, on the contrary. He seems afraid of appearing to enjoy it before you or any belonging to you. He is as dependent and resigned to your will as if he had not a farthing but what must come from your immediate bounty. You have ever acted like a good and generous father, and he like an obedient and grateful son. Nay, his carriage is so easy to all with whom he converses that he is never assuming never prefers himself to others, nor ever is guilty of that rough sincerity which a man is not called to, and certainly disobliges most of his acquaintance. To be short, Humphrey, his reputation was so fair in the world, that old Sealand, the great India merchant, has offered his only daughter, and sole heiress to that vast estate of his, as a wife for him. You may be sure I made no difficulties. The match was agreed on, and this very day named for the wedding. What hinders the preceding? Don't interrupt me. 
You know I was last Thursday at the masquerade. My son, you may remember, soon found us out. He knew his grandfather's habit, which I then wore, and though it was the mode in the last age, yet the maskers, you know, followed us as if we had been the most monstrous figures in that whole assembly. I remember indeed a young man of quality in the habit of a clown that was particularly troublesome. Right. He was too much what he seemed to be. You remember how impertinently he followed and teased us, and would know who we were. Humphrey, aside. I know he has a mind to come into that particular. Aye. He followed us till the gentleman who led the lady in the India mantle presented that gay creature to the rustic, and bid him, like Simon in the fable, grow polite by falling in love, and let that worthy old gentleman alone, meaning me. The clown was not reformed, but rudely persisted, and offered to force off my mask. With that, the gentleman, throwing off his own, appeared to be my son, and in his concern for me, tore off that of the nobleman. At this they seized each other, the company called the guards, and in the surprise the lady swooned away, upon which my son quitted his adversary, and had now no care but of the lady. When raising her in his arms, Art thou gone? cried he, for ever? Forbid it, heaven! She revived at his known voice, and with the most familiar, though modest, gesture, hangs in safety over his shoulder weeping, but wept as in the arms of one before whom she could give herself a loose, were she not under observation. While she hides her face in his neck, he carefully conveys her from the company. I have observed this accident has dwelt upon you very strongly. Her uncommon air, her noble modesty, the dignity of her person, and the occasion itself, drew the whole assembly together, and I soon heard it buzzed about she was the adopted daughter of a famous sea officer who had served in France. Now this unexpected and public discovery of my son's so deep concern for her was what I supposed alarmed Mr. Sealand, in behalf of his daughter, to break off the match. You are right. He came to me yesterday and said he thought himself disengaged from the bargain, being credibly informed my son was already married, or worse, to the lady at the masquerade. I palliated matters and insisted on our agreement, but we parted with little less than a direct breach between us. Well, sir, and what notice have you taken of all this to my young master? That's what I wanted to debate with you. I have said nothing to him yet. But look you, Humphrey, if there is so much in this amour of his that he denies upon my summons to marry, I have cause enough to be offended. And then, by my insisting upon his marrying today, I shall know how far he is engaged to this lady in masquerade, and from thence only shall be able to take my measures. In the meantime, I would have you find out how far that rogue, his man, is let into his secret. He, I know, will play tricks as much to cross me as to serve his master. Why do you think of him so, sir? I believe he is no worse than I was for you at your son's age. I see it in the rascal's looks. But I have dwelt on these things too long. I'll go to my son immediately, and while I'm gone, your part is to convince his rogue, Tom, that I am in earnest. I'll leave him to you. Exit Sir John Beville. Well, though this father and son live as well together as possible, yet their fear of giving each other pain is attended with constant mutual uneasiness. I'm sure I have enough to do, to be honest, and yet keep well with them both. But they know I love them, and that makes the task less painful, however. Oh, here's the prince of poor coxcombs, the representative of all the better fed than taught. Ho, ho, Tom, whither so gay and so airy this morning? Enter Tom, singing. Sir, we servants of single gentlemen are another kind of people than you domestic or no judges that do business. We are race above you. The pleasures of board wages, tavern dinners, and many a clear gain. Veils, alas, you never heard or dreamt of. Thou hast follies and vices enough for a man of ten thousand a year. 
though tis but as t'other day that i sent for you to town to put you into mr seeland's family that you might learn a little before i put you to my young master who is too gentle for training such a rude thing as you were in too proper obedience you then pulled off your hat to every one you met in the street like a bashful great awkward cub as you were but your great oaken cudgel when you were a bobby became you much better than that dangling stick at your button now you are a fop that's fit for nothing except it hangs there to be ready for your master's hand when you are impertinent uncle humphrey you know my master scorns to strike his servants you talk as if the world was now just as it was when my old master and you were in your youth when you went to dinner because it was so much a clock when the great blow was given in the hall at the pantry door and all the family came out of their holes in such strange dresses and formal faces as you see in the pictures in our long gallery in the country why you wild rogue you could not fall to your dinner till a formal fellow in a black gown said something of the meat as if the cook had not made it ready enough sirrah who do you prate after despising men of sacred characters i hope you never heard my good young master talk so like a profligate sir i say you put upon me when i first came to town about being orderly the doctrine of wearing shams to make linen last clean a fortnight keeping my clothes fresh and wearing a frock within doors sirrah i gave you those lessons because i supposed at the time your master and you might have dined at home every day and cost you nothing then you might have made a good family servant but the gang you have frequented since at chocolate houses and taverns in a continual round of noise and extravagance i don't know what you heavy inmates call noise and extravagance but we gentlemen who are well fed and cut a figure sir think it a fine life as we must be very pretty fellows who are kept only to be looked at uh, very well sir i hope the fashion of being lewd and extravagant despising of decency and order is almost at an end since it has arrived at persons of your quality master humphrey <laughs> you are an unhappy lad to be sent up to town in such queer days as you were why now sir the lackeys are the men of pleasure of the age the top gamesters and many a lace coat about town have had their education in our party-coloured regiment we are false lovers have a taste of music poetry be do dress politics ruined damsels and when we are tired of this lewd town and have a mind to take up whip into our master's wigs and linen and merry fortunes heyday nay sir our order is carried up to the highest dignities and distinctions step but into the painted chamber and by our titles you take us all for men of quality then again come down to the court of requests and you see us all laying our broken heads together for the good of the nation and though we never carry a question nemine corto decente yet this i can say with a safe conscience and i wish every gentleman of our cloth could lay his hand upon his heart and say the same so i never took so much as a single mug of beer for my vote in all my life sirrah there is no enduring your extravagance i'll hear you prate no longer i wanted to see you to inquire how things go with your master as far as you understand them i suppose he knows he is to be married to-day ay sir he knows it and is dressed as gay as the sun but between you and i my dear he has a very heavy heart under all that gaiety as soon as he was dressed i retired but overheard him sigh in the most heavy manner he walked thoughtfully to and fro in the room then went into his closet when he came out he gave me this for his mistress whose maid you know is passionately fond of your fine person the poor fool is so tender and loves to hear me talk of the world and the plays operas and ridottos for the winter the parks and bellsides for our summer diversions and lard says she you are so wild but you have a world of humour ah coxcomb well but why don't you run with your master's letter to mrs lucinda as he ordered you because mistress lucinda is not so easily come at as you think for not easily come at uh, why sirrah are not her father and my old master agreed that she and mr bevel are to be one flesh before to-morrow morning it's no matter for that her mother it seems mistress seeland has not agreed to it 
and you must know master humphrey that in that family the grey mare is the better horse what dost thou mean in one word mr sealand pretends to have a will of her own and has provided a relation of hers a stiff starched philosopher and a wise fool for her daughter for which reason for these ten days past she has suffered no message nor letter from my master to come near her and where had you this intelligence from her foolish fond self that can keep nothing from me one that will deliver this letter to if she is rightly managed what her pretty handmaid mrs phyllis even she sir this is the very hour you know she usually comes hither under a pretence of a visit to your housekeeper forsooth but in reality you'd have a glance at your sweet face i warrant you nothing else in nature you must know i love to fret and play with the little wanton play with the little wanton what will this world come to i met her this morning in a new manteau and petticoat not a bit the worse for her lady's wearing and she has always new thoughts and new airs with new clothes then she never fails to seal some glance or gesture from every visitant at the house and is indeed the whole town of the coquettes at second hand but here she comes in one motion she speaks and describes herself better than all the words in the world can then i hope dear sir when your own affair is over you will be so good as to mind your masters with her dear humphrey you know my master's my friend and those are people i never forget ah sauciness itself uh, but I'll leave you to do your best for him. Exit. Enter Phyllis. Oh, Mr. Thomas, is Mrs. Sugarkey at home? Lord, one is almost ashamed to pass along the streets. The town is quite empty and nobody of fashion left in it. And the ordinary people do stare to see anything dressed like a woman of condition, as if it were on the same floor as them pass by alas alas it is a sad thing to walk oh fortune fortune what a sad thing to walk why madam phyllis do you wish yourself lame no mr tom but i wish i were generally carried in a coach or a chair and of a fortune neither to stand nor go but to totter or slide to be short-sighted or to stare to fleer in the face to look distant to observe to overlook yet all become me and if i was rich i could twire and loll as well as the best of them ah oh tom tom is it not a pity that you should be so great a coxcomb and i so great a coquette and yet be such poor devils as we are mistress phyllis i am your humble servant for that yes mr thomas i know how much you are my humble servant and i know what you said to miss judy upon seeing her in one of her lady's cast manteaus that any one would have thought her the lady and that she had ordered the other to wear it till it sat easy for now only it was becoming to my lady it was only a covering to miss judy it was a habit this you said after somebody or other oh tom tom thou art as false and as base as the best gentleman of them all ah but you wretch talk to me no more on the old odious subject don't i say tom in a submissive tone retiring i know not how to resist your commands madam commands about parting are grown mighty easy to you of late tom aside oh i have her oh, i have nettled and put into the right temper to be wrought upon and set to prating why truly to be plain with you mistress phyllis i can take little comfort of late in frequenting a house pray mr thomas what is it all of a sudden offends your nicety at our house i don't care to speak particulars but i dislike the whole i thank you sir i am part of that whole mistake me not good phyllis good phyllis saucy enough but however i say it is that thou art a part which gives me pain for the disposition of the whole 
You must know, madam, to be serious, I am a man at the bottom of prodigious nice honour. You are too much exposed to company at your house. To be plain, I don't like so many that would be your mistress' lovers whispering to you. Don't think to put that upon me. You say this because I wrung you to the heart when I touched your guilty conscience about Judy. Ah, Phyllis, Phyllis, if you but knew my heart. <laughs> I know too much on it. Nay, then, poor Crispo's fate and mine are one. Therefore give me leave to say, or sing at least, as he does upon the same occasion, Savidity, etc. What? Do you think I'm to be fobbed off with a song? I don't question, but you have sung the same to Miss Judy, too. Don't disparage your charms, good Phyllis, with jealousy of so worthless an object. Besides, she is a poor hussy, and if you doubt the sincerity of my love, you will allow me true to my interest. You are a fortune, Phyllis. What would the fop be at now? In good time, indeed, you shall be setting up a fortune. Dear Mistress Phyllis, you have such a spirit that we shall never be dull in marriage when we come together. But I tell you, you are a fortune, and you have an estate in my hands. He pulls out a purse. She eyes it. What pretense have I to what is in your hands, Mr. Tom? As thus. There are hours, you know, when a lady is neither pleased or displeased, neither sick or well, when she lolls or loiters, when she is without desires, from having more of everything than she knows what to do with. Well, what then? When she has not life enough to keep her bright eyes quite open, to look at her own dear image in the glass. Explain thyself, and don't be so fond of thy own pratting. There are also prosperous and good-natured moments, as when a knot or a patch is happily fixed, when the complexion particularly flourishes. Well, what then? I have not patience. Why then, or on the like occasions, we servants who have skill to know how to tie in business see when such a pretty folded thing as this shows a letter may be presented, laid or dropped as best suits the present humour. And, madam, because it is a long, wearisome journey to run through all the several stages of a lady's temper, my master, who is the most reasonable man in the world, presents you this to bear your charges on the road. Gives her the purse. Ha! Huh. Now you think me a corrupt hussy. Oh, fie! I only think you'll take the letter. Nay, I know you do. But I know my own innocence. I take it for my mistress's sake. I know it, my pretty one. I know it. Yes, I say I do it, because I would not have my mistress deluded by one who gives no proof of his passion. But I'll talk more of tips as you see me on my way home. No, Tom, I assure thee, I take this trash of thy master's, not for the value of the thing, but as it convinces me he has a true respect for my mistress. I remember a verse to the purpose. They may be false who languish and complain, but they who part with money never feign. Exeunt. Scene 2. Beville Jr.'s Lodgings. Beville Jr. Reading. These moral writers practice virtue after death, this charming vision of Mirza. Such an author consulted in a morning sets the spirit for the vicissitudes of the day better than the glass does a man's person. But what a day I have to go through, to put on an easy look with an aching heart. If this lady my father urges me to marry should not refuse me, my dilemma is insupportable. But why should I fear it? Is she not in equal distress with me? Has not the letter I sent her this morning confessed my inclination to another? Nay, have I not moral assurances of her engagements too, to my friend Myrtle? It's impossible, but she must give in to it, for sure to be denied is a favour any man may pretend to. It must be so. Well then, with the assurance of being rejected, I think I may confidently say to my father, I am ready to marry her. Then let me resolve upon what I am not very good at, though, is an honest dissimulation. Enter Tom. Sir John Bevel, sir, is in the next room. Dunce! Why did you not bring him in? I told him, sir, you were in your closet. I thought you had known, sir. It was my duty to see my father anywhere. Going himself to the door. Tom, aside. The devil's in my master. He has always more wit than I have. 
Beville Jr. introducing Sir John. Sir, you are the most gallant, the most complacent of all parents. Sure, tis not a compliment to say these lodgings are yours. Why would you not walk in, sir? I was loath to interrupt you unseasonably on your wedding day. One to whom I am beholden for my birthday might have used less ceremony. Oh, well, son, I have intelligence you have writ to your mistress this morning. It would please my curiosity to know the contents of a wedding-day letter, for courtship must then be over. I assure you, sir, there is no insolence in it upon the prospect of such a vast fortunes being added to our family, but much acknowledgment of the lady's greater desert. But, dear Jack, are you in earnest in all this? And will you really marry her? Did I ever disobey any command of yours, sir? Nay, any inclination that I saw you bent upon? Why, I can't say you have, son. But methinks in this whole business you have not been so warm as I could have wished you. You have visited her, it's true, but you have not been particular. Everyone knows you can say and do as handsome things as any man, but you have done nothing but lived in the general, been complacent only. As I am ever prepared to marry, if you bid me, so I am ready to let it alone, if you will have me. Humphrey enters unobserved. Look you there now. Why, what am I to think of this so absolute and so indifferent a resignation? Think? That I am still your son, sir. You have been married, and I have not. And you have, sir, found the inconvenience there is when a man weds with too much love in his head. I have been told, sir, that at the time you married, you made a mighty bustle on the occasion. There was challenging and fighting, scaling walls, locking up the lady— and the gallant under an arrest for fear of killing all his rivals. Now, sir, I suppose you have found the ill consequences of these strong passions and prejudices, in preference of one woman to another, in case of a man's becoming a widower. How is this? I say, sir, experience has made you wiser in your care of me, for, sir, since you lost my dear mother, your time has been so heavy, so lonely, and so tasteless, that you are so good as to guard me against the like unhappiness by marrying me prudently by way of bargain and sale. For, as you well judge, a woman that is espoused for a fortune is yet a better bargain if she dies. For then a man still enjoys what he did marry, the money, and is disencumbered of what he did not marry, the woman. But pray, sir, do you think Lucinda, then, a woman of such little merit? Pardon me, sir, I don't carry it so far, neither. I am rather afraid I shall like her too well. She has, for one of her fortune, a great many needless and superfluous good qualities. I'm afraid, son, there's something I don't see yet, something that's smothered under all this raillery. Not in the least, sir. If the lady is dressed and ready, you see I am. I suppose the lawyers are ready, too. Humphrey, aside. Oh, this may grow warm if I don't interpose. Sir, uh, Mr. Sealand is at the coffee-house, and has sent to speak with you. Oh, that's well. Then I warrant the lawyers are ready. Son, you'll be in the way, you say? If you please, sir, I'll take a chair and go to Mr. Sealand's, where the young lady and I will wait to your leisure. By no means. The old fellow will be so vain if he sees. Aye, but the young lady, sir, will think me so indifferent. Humphrey. Aside to Bevel Jr. Ay, there you are right. Press your readiness to go to the bride. He won't let you. Bevel Jr. Aside to Humphrey. Are you sure of that? How he likes being prevented. Sir John Bevel, looking on his watch. No, no. You are an hour or two too early. You'll allow me, sir, to think it too late to visit a beautiful, virtuous young woman in the pride and bloom of life, ready to give herself to my arms and place her happiness or misery for the future in being agreeable or displeasing to me is a... Uh, call a chair. No, 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 dear Jack. This sealant is a moody old fellow. There is no dealing with some people but by managing with indifference. We must leave to him the conduct of this day. It is the last of his commanding his daughter. Sir, he can't take it ill that I am impatient to be hers. Pray let me govern in this matter. You can't tell how humorsome some old fellows are. 
There's no offering reason to some of them, especially when they are rich. Aside. If my son should see him before I brought old Seeland into better temper, the match would be impracticable. Humphrey, aside to Sir John. Pray, sir, let me beg you to let Mr. Bevel go. See whether he will or not. Then to Bevel. Pray, sir, command yourself. Since you see my master is positive, it is better you should not go. My father commands me as to the object of my affections, but I hope he will not as to the warmth and height of them. So, I must even leave things as I found them, and in the meantime, at least, keep old Sealand out of his sight. Well, son, I'll go myself and take orders in your affair. You'll be in the way, I suppose, if I send to you. I'll leave your old friend with you. Humphrey, don't let him stir, do you hear? Your servant, your servant. Exit Sir John. I have a sad time on it, sir, between you and my master. I see you are unwilling, and I know his violent inclinations for the match. I must betray neither, and yet deceive you both, for your common good. Heaven grant a good end of this matter. Ah, but there is a lady, sir, that gives your father much trouble and sorrow. You'll uh, pardon me. Humphrey, I know thou art a friend to both, and in that confidence I dare tell thee that lady is a woman of honour and virtue. You may assure yourself I never will marry without my father's consent, but give me leave to say, too, this declaration does not come up to a promise that I will take whomsoever he pleases. Come, sir, I wholly understand you. You would engage my services to free you from this woman whom my master intends you to make way in time for the woman you have really a mind to. Honest Humphrey, you have always been a useful friend to my father and myself. I beg you continue your good offices, and don't let us come to the necessity of a dispute, for, if we should dispute, I must either part with more than life or lose the best of fathers. My dear master, were I but worthy to know this secret that so near concerns you, my life, uh, my all, should be engaged to serve you. This, sir, I dare promise, that I am sure I will and can be secret. Your trust at worst but leaves you where you were, and if I cannot serve you, I will at once be plain and tell you so. That's all I ask. Thou hast made it now my interest to trust thee. Be patient, then, and hear the story of my heart. I am all attention, sir. You may remember, Humphrey, that in my last travels my father grew uneasy at my making so long a stay at Toulon. I remember it. He was apprehensive some woman had laid hold of you. His fears were just, for there I first saw this lady. She is of English birth. Her father's name was Danvers a younger brother of an ancient family, and originally an eminent merchant of Bristol, who, upon repeated misfortunes, was reduced to go privately to the Indies. In this retreat, Providence again grew favourable to his industry, and in six years' time restored him to his former fortunes. On this he sent directions over that his wife and little family should follow him to the Indies. His wife, impatient to obey such welcome orders, would not wait the leisure of a convoy, but took the first occasion of a single ship, and, with her husband's sister only, and this daughter, then scarce seven years old, undertook the fatal voyage. For here, poor creature, she lost her liberty and life. She and her family, with all they had, were unfortunately taken by a privateer from Toulon, being thus made a prisoner, though as such not ill-treated, yet the fright, the shock, and cruel disappointment seized with such violence upon her unhealthy frame, she sickened, pined, and died at sea. Poor soul, oh, the helpless infant! Her sister yet survived, and had the care of her. The captain, too, proved to have humanity, and became a father to her, for having himself married an Englishwoman, and being childless, he brought her into Toulon, with her little countrywoman, presenting her, with all her dead mother's movables of value, to his wife, to be educated as his own adopted daughter. Fortune here seemed again to smile on her. Only to make her frowns more terrible, for in his height of fortune, this captain too, 
her benefactor, unfortunately, was killed at sea and dying intestate, his estate fell wholly to an advocate, his brother, who, coming to take possession there, found, among his other riches, this blooming virgin at his mercy. He durst not, sir, abuse his power. No wonder if his pampered blood was fired at the sight of her. In short, he loved, but when all arts and gentle means had failed to move, he offered to his menaces in vain, denouncing vengeance on her cruelty, demanding her to account for all her maintenance from her childhood, seized on her little fortune as his own inheritance, and was dragging her by violence to prison, when providence at the instant interposed, and sent me, by miracle, to relieve her. "'Twas providence indeed. But pray, sir, after all this trouble, how came this lady at last to England? The disappointed advocate, finding she had so unexpected a support, on cooler thoughts descended to a composition which I, without her knowledge, secretly discharged. That generous concealment made the obligation double. Having thus obtained her liberty, I prevailed, not without some difficulty, to see her safe to England, where no sooner arrived but my father, jealous of my being imprudently engaged, immediately proposed this other fatal match that hangs upon my quiet. I find, sir, you are irrecoverably fixed upon this lady. As my vital life dwells in my heart, and yet you see what I do to please my father, walk in this pageantry of dress, this splendid covering of sorrow, but, Humphrey, you have your lesson. Now, sir, I have but one material question. Ask it freely. Is it then your own passion for this secret lady, or hers for you, that gives you this aversion to the match your father has proposed you? I shall appear, Humphrey, more romantic in my answer than in all the rest of my story, for though I dote on her to death, and have no little reason to believe she has the same thoughts for me, yet, in all my acquaintance, and utmost privacies with her, I never once directly told her that I loved. How was it possible to avoid it? My tender obligations to my father have laid so inviolable a restraint upon my conduct that, till I have his consent to speak, I am determined on that subject to be dumb forever. Well, sir, to your praise be it spoken, you are certainly the most unfashionable lover in Great Britain. Enter Tom. Sir, Master Myrtle's at the next door, and if you are at leisure, we'll be glad to wait on you. Whenever he pleases. Hold, Tom, did you receive no answer to my letter? Sir, I was desired to call again, for I was told her mother would not let her be out of her sight. But about an hour hence, Mistress Lettice said I should certainly have one. Very well. Exit Tom. Sir, I will take another opportunity. In the meantime... I only think it proper to tell you that, from a secret I know, you may appear to your father as forward as you please, to marry Lucinda without the least hazard of its coming to a conclusion. Sir, your most obedient servant. Honest Humphrey, continue but my friend in this exigence, and you shall always find me yours. Exit Humphrey. I long to hear how my letter has succeeded with Lucinda, but I think it cannot fail, for, at worst, were it possible she could take it ill, her resentment of my indifference may as probably occasion a delay as her taking it right. Poor Myrtle! What terrors must he be in, in all this while, since he knows she is offered to me, and refused to him? There is no conversing or taking any measures with him for his own service. But I ought to bear with my friend, and use him as one in adversity." All his disquiets by my own I prove, the greatest grief's perplexity in love. Exit. End of Act One. Act Two of The Conscious Lovers by Richard Steele. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Second Scene One Bevel Junior's Lodgings Enter Bevel Junior and Tom. 
Sir, Master Myrtle. Very well. Do you step again and wait for an answer to my letter? Exit Tom. Enter Myrtle. Well, Charles, why so much care in thy countenance? Is there anything in this world deserves it? You who used to be so gay, so open, so vacant. I think we have of late changed complexions. You, who used to be much the graver man, are now all air in your behaviour. But the cause of my concern may, for aught I know, be the same object that gives you all this satisfaction. In a word, I am told that you are this very day, and your dress confirms it to me, to be married to Lucinda. You are not misinformed. Nay, put not on the terrors of a rival till you hear me out. I shall disoblige the best of fathers if I don't seem ready to marry Lucinda. And you know, I have ever told you, you might make use of my secret resolution never to marry her for your own service, as you please. But I am now driven to the extremity of immediately refusing or complying, unless you help me to escape the match. Escape? Sir, neither her merit or her fortune are below your acceptance. Escaping, do you call it? Dear sir, do you wish I should desire the match? No! But such is my humorous and sickly state of mind, since it has been able to relish nothing but Lucinda, that though I may owe my happiness to your aversion to this marriage, I can't bear to hear her spoken of with levity or unconcern. Pardon me, sir. I shall transgress that way no more. She has understanding, beauty, shape, complexion, wit. Nay, dear Bevel, don't speak of her as if you loved her neither. Why, then, to give you ease at once, Though I allow Lucinda to have good sense, wit, beauty, and virtue, I know another in whom these qualities appear to me more amiable than in her. There, you spoke like a reasonable and good-natured friend. When you acknowledge her merit and own your prepossession for another, at once you gratify my fondness and cure my jealousy. But all this while you take no notice. You have no apprehension of another man that has twice the fortune of either of us. Simberton, hang him, a formal, philosophical, pedantic coxcomb, for that sought with all these crude notions of diverse things, under the direction of great vanity and very little judgment, shows his strongest bias and avarice, which is so predominant in him that he will examine the limbs of his mistress with the caution of a jockey, and pays no more compliment to her personal charms than if she were a mere breeding animal. Are you sure that is not affected? I have known some women sooner set on fire by that sort of negligence than by... No, no. Hang him. The rogue has no art. It is pure, simple insolence and stupidity. Yet, with all this, I don't take him for a fool. I own the man is not unnatural. He is a very quick sense, though very slow understanding. He says, indeed, many things that want only the circumstances of time and place to be very just and agreeable. Well, you may be sure of me if you can disappoint him, but my intelligence says the mother has actually sent for the conveyancer to draw articles for his marriage with Lucinda, though those for mine with her are, by her father's orders, ready for signing, but it seems she has not thought fit to consult either him or his daughter in the matter. Sha! A poor troublesome woman. Neither Lucinda nor her father will ever be brought to comply with it. Besides, I am sure Simberton can make no settlement upon her without the concurrence of his great-uncle, Sir Geoffrey, in the West. Well, sir, and I can tell you that's the very point that is now laid before her council, to know whether a firm settlement can be made without his uncle's actual joining in it. Now, pray consider, sir, when my affair with Lucinda comes, as it soon must, to an open rupture, how are you sure that Simberton's fortune may not then tempt her father, too, to hear his proposals? There, you are right, indeed. That must be provided against. Do you know who are her counsel? Yes, for your service I have found out that too. They are Sergeant Bramble and Old Target. By the way, they are neither of them known in the family. Now, I was thinking... Why, you might not put a couple of false counsel upon her to delay and confound matters a little. Besides, it may probably let you into the bottom of her whole design against you. As how, pray? 
why can't you slip on a black wig and a gown and be old bramble yourself ha i don't dislike it but what shall i do for a brother in the case what think you of my fellow tom the rogue's intelligent and is a good mimic all his part will be but to stutter heartily for that's old target's case nay it would be an immoral thing to mock him were it not that his impertinence is the occasion of its breaking out to that degree the conduct of the scene will chiefly lie upon you i like it of all things if you'll send tom to my chambers i will give him full instructions this will certainly give me occasion to raise difficulties to puzzle or confound her project for a while at least i'll warrant you success so far we are right then and now charles your apprehension of my marrying her is all you have to get over dear bevel though i know you are my friend yet when i abstract myself from my own interest in a thing i know no objection she can make to you or you to her and therefore hope dear myrtle i am as much obliged to you for the cause of your suspicion as i am offended at the effect but be assured i am taking measures for your certain security and that all things with regard to me will end in your entire satisfaction well i'll promise you to be as easy and as confident as i can though i cannot but remember that i have more than life at stake on your fidelity going then depend upon it you have no chance against you nay no ceremony you know i must be going exit myrtle well this is another instance of the perplexities which arise too in faithful friendship we must often in this life go on in our good offices even under the displeasure of those to whom we do them in compassion to their weaknesses and mistakes but all this while poor indiana is tortured with the doubt of me she has no support or comfort but in my fidelity yet she sees me daily pressed to marriage with another how painful in such a crisis must be every hour she thinks on me i'll let her see at least my conduct to her is not changed i'll take this opportunity to visit her for though the religious vow i have made to my father restrains me from ever marrying without his approbation yet that confines me not from seeing a virtuous woman that is the pure delight of my eyes and the guiltless joy of my heart but the best condition of human life is but a gentler misery to hope for perfect happiness is vain and love has ever its allays of pain exit scene two indiana's lodgings enter isabella and indiana yes i say tis artifice dear child i say to thee again and again tis all skill and management will you persuade me there can be an ill design in supporting me in the condition of a woman of quality attended dressed and lodged like one in my appearance abroad and my furniture at home every way in the most sumptuous manner and he that does it has an artifice a design in it yes yes and all this without so much as explaining to me that all about me comes from him ay ay the more for that that keeps the title to all you have the more in him the more in him he scorns the thought then he 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 well be not so eager if he is an ill man let us look into his stratagems here is another of them showing a letter here's two hundred and fifty pounds in bank-notes with these words to pay for the set of dressing plate which will be brought home to-morrow why dear aunt now here's another piece of skill for you which i own i cannot comprehend and it is with a bleeding heart i hear you say anything to the disadvantage of mr beville when he is present i look upon him as one to whom i owe my life and the support of it then again as the man who loves me with sincerity and honour when his eyes are cast another way and i dare survey him my heart is painfully divided between shame and love oh could i tell you ah you need not i imagine all this for you this is my state of mind in his presence and when he is absent 
you are ever dinning my ears with notions of the arts of men that his hidden bounty his respectful conduct his careful provision for me after his preserving me from utmost misery are certain signs he means nothing but to make i know not what of me oh you have a sweet opinion of him truly i have when i am with him ten thousand things besides my sex's natural decency and shame to suppress my heart that yearns to thank to praise to say it loves him i say thus it is with me while i see him and in his absence i am entertained with nothing but your endeavours to tear this amiable image from my heart and in its stead to place a base dissembler an artful invader of my happiness my innocence my honour ah poor soul has not his plot taken don't you die for him has not the way he has taken been the most proper with you oh oh he has sense and has judged the thing right go on then since nothing can answer you say what you will of him hey ho hey ho indeed it is better to say so as you are now than as many others are there are among the destroyers of women the gentle the generous the mild the affable the humble who all soon after their success in their designs turn to the contrary of those characters i will own to you mr bevel carries his hypocrisy the best of any man living but still he is a man and therefore a hypocrite they have usurped an exemption from shame for any baseness any cruelty towards us they embrace without love they make vows without conscience of obligation they are partners nay seducers to the crime wherein they pretend to be less guilty indiana aside that's truly observed but what's all this to beville this it is to bevel and all mankind trust not those who will think the worse of you for your confidence in them serpents who lie in wait for doves won't you be on your guard against those who would betray you won't you doubt those who would contemn you for believing them take it from me fair and natural dealing is to invite injuries tis bleating to escape wolves who would devour you such is the world aside and such since the behaviour of one man to myself have i believed all the rest of the sex i will not doubt the truth of beville i will not doubt it he has not spoke of it by an organ that is given to lying his eyes are all that have ever told me that he was mine i know his virtue i know his filial piety and ought to trust his management with a father to whom he has uncommon obligations what have i to be concerned for my lesson is very short if he takes me for ever my purpose of life is only to please him if he leaves me which heaven avert i know he'll do it nobly and i shall have nothing to do but to learn to die after worse than death has happened to me i do persist in your credulity flatter yourself that a man of his figure and fortune will make himself the jest of the town and marry a handsome beggar for love the town i must tell you madam the fools that laugh at mr beville will but make themselves more ridiculous his actions are the results of thinking and he has sense enough to make even virtue fashionable oh my conscience he has turned her head come come if he were the honest fool you take him for why has he kept you here these three weeks without sending you to bristol in search of your father your family and your relations i am convinced he still designs it and that nothing keeps him here but the necessity of not coming to an open breach with his father in regard to the match he has proposed him besides has he not read to bristol and has not he advised that my father has not been heard of there almost these twenty years all sham mere evasion he is afraid if he should carry you thither your honest relations may take you out of his hands and so blow up all his wicked hopes at once wicked hopes 
Did I ever give him any such? Has he ever given you any honest ones? Can you say in your conscience he has ever once offered to marry you? No, but by his behaviour I am convinced he will offer it the moment it is in his power or consistent with his honour to make such a promise good to me. His honour? I will rely upon it. Therefore, desire you will not make my life uneasy by these ungrateful jealousies of one to whom I am and wish to be obliged. For, from his integrity alone, I have resolved to hope for happiness. Nay, I have done my duty. If you won't see, at your peril be it. Let it be. This is his hour of visiting me. No, oh, to be sure, keep up your form. Don't see him in a bedchamber. Apart. This is pure prudence. When she is liable, wherever he meets her, to be conveyed where'er he pleases. All the rest of my life is but waiting till he comes. I live only when I'm with him. Exit. Well, go thy ways, thou wilful innocent. Aside. I once had almost as much love for a man who poorly left me to marry an estate. And I am now, against my will, what they call an old maid. But I will not let the peevishness of that condition grow upon me, only keep up the suspicion of it, to prevent this creature's being any other than a virgin, except upon proper terms. Exit. Re-enter Indiana, speaking to a servant. Desire Mr. Beville to walk in. Design? Impossible. A base designing mind could never think of what he hourly puts in practice, and yet, since the late rumour of his marriage, he seems more reserved than formerly. He sends in, too, before he sees me, to know if I am at leisure. Such new respects may cover coldness in the heart. It certainly makes me thoughtful. I'll know the worst at once. I'll lay such fair occasions in his way that it shall be impossible to avoid an explanation, for these doubts are insupportable. But see, he comes and clears them all. Enter Bevel. Madam, you're most obedient. I'm afraid I broke in upon your rest last night. T'was very late before we parted, but t'was your own fault. I never saw you in such agreeable humour. I am extremely glad we were both pleased, for I thought I never saw you better company. Me, madam, you rally. I said very little. But I am afraid you heard me say a great deal, and when a woman is in the talking vein, the most agreeable thing a man can do, you know, is to have patience to hear her. Then it's pity, madam, you should ever be silent that we might be always agreeable to one another. If I had your talent or power to make my actions speak for me, I might indeed be silent, and you can pretend to something more than the agreeable. If I might be vain of anything in my power, madam, tis that my understanding from all your sex has marked you out as the most deserving object of my esteem. Should I think I deserve this, twere enough to make my vanity forfeit the very esteem you offer me. How so, madam? Because esteem is the result of reason, and to deserve it from good sense, the height of human glory. Nay, I had rather a man of honour should pay me that, than all the homage of a sincere and humble love. You certainly distinguish right, madam. Love often kindles from external merit only. But esteem rises from a higher source, the merit of the soul. True, and great souls only can deserve it. Bowing respectfully. Now I think they are greater still that can so charitably part with it. Now, madam, you make me vain, since the utmost pride and pleasure of my life is that I esteem you as I ought. Indiana, aside. As he ought, still more perplexing, he neither saves nor kills my hope. But, madam, we grow grave, methinks. Let's find some other subject. Pray, how did you like the opera last night? First give me leave to thank you for my tickets. Oh, your servant, madam. But pray tell me, you now who are never partial to the fashion, I fancy you must be the properest judge of a mighty dispute among the ladies, that is, whether Crispo or Griselda is the more agreeable entertainment. 
with submission now i cannot be a proper judge of this question how so madam because i find i have a partiality for one of them pray which is that i do not know there is something in that rural cottage of griselda her forlorn condition her poverty her solitude her resignation her innocent slumbers and that lulling dolce sogno that sang over her it had an effect upon me that in short i never was so well deceived at any of them oh now then i can account for the dispute griselda it seems is the distress of an injured innocent woman crispo that only of a man in the same condition therefore the men are mostly concerned for crispo and by natural indulgence both sexes for griselda so that judgment you think ought to be for one though fancy and complacence have got ground for the other well i believe you will never give me leave to dispute with you on any subject for i own crispo has its charms for me too though in the main all the pleasure the best opera gives us is but mere sensation methinks it's pity the mind can't have a little more share in the entertainment the music's certainly fine but in my thoughts there's none of your composers come up to old shakespeare and otway how madam why if a woman of your sense were to say this in a drawing-room enter a servant sir here's signor carbonelli says he waits your commands in the next room apropos you were saying yesterday madam you had a mind to hear him will you give him leave to entertain you now by all means desire the gentleman to walk in exit servant i fancy you will find something in this hand that is uncommon you are always finding ways mr bevel to make life seem less tedious to me enter music master when the gentleman pleases after a sonata is played bevel waits on the master to the door etc you smile madam to see me so complacent to one whom i pay for his visit now i own i think it is not enough barely to pay those whose talents are superior to our own i mean such talents as would become our condition if we had them methinks we ought to do something more than barely gratify them for what they do at our command only because their fortune is below us you say i smile i assure you it was a smile of approbation for indeed i cannot but think it the distinguishing part of a gentleman to make his superiority of fortune as easy to his inferiors as he can aside now once more to try him i was saying just now i believed you would never let me dispute with you and i dare say it will always be so however i must have your opinion upon a subject which created a debate between my aunt and me just before you came hither she would needs have it that no man ever does any extraordinary kindness or service for a woman but for his own sake well madam indeed i can't but be of her mind what though he should maintain and support her without demanding anything of her on her part why madam is making an expense in the service of a valuable woman for such i must suppose her though she should never do him any favour nay though she should never know who did her such service such a mighty heroic business certainly i should think he must be a man of an uncommon mould dear madam why so tis but at best a better taste in expense to bestow upon one whom he may think one of the ornaments of the whole creation to be conscious that from his superfluity an innocent a virtuous spirit is supported above the temptations and sorrows of life that he sees satisfaction health and gladness in her countenance while he enjoys the happiness of seeing her as that i will suppose too or he must be too abstracted to insensible i say if he is allowed to delight in that prospect alas what mighty matter is there in all this no mighty matter in so disinterested a friendship disinterested i can't think him so your hero madam is no more than what every gentleman ought to be and i believe very many are he is only one who takes more delight in reflections than in sensations he is more pleased with thinking than eating that's the utmost you can say of him why madam 
a greater expense than all this, men lay out upon an unnecessary stable of horses. Can you be sincere in what you say? You may depend upon it. If you know any such man, he does not love dogs inordinately. No, that he does not. Nor cards, nor dice. No. Nor bottle companions. No. Nor loose women. No, I'm sure he does not. Take my word, then, if your admired hero is not liable to any of these kinds of demands, there's no such preeminence in this as you imagine. Nay, this way of expense you speak of is what exalts and raises him that has a taste for it, and, at the same time, his delight is incapable of satiety, disgust, or penitence. But still, I insist, his having no private interest in the action makes it prodigious, almost incredible. Dear madam, I never know you more mistaken. Why, who can be more a usurer than he who lays out his money in such valuable purchases? If pleasure be worth purchasing, how great a pleasure is it to him, who has a true taste of life, to ease an aching heart, to see the human countenance lighted up into smiles of joy on the receipt of a bit of ore which is superfluous and otherwise useless in a man's own pocket. What could a man do better with his cash? This is the effect of a human disposition, where there is only a general tie of nature and common necessity. What then must it be when we serve an object of merit, of admiration? Well, the more you argue against it, the more I shall admire the generosity. Nay, nay, then, madam, tis time to fly, after a declaration that my opinion strengthens my adversary's argument. I had best hasten to my appointment with Mr. Myrtle, and be gone while we are friends, and before things are brought to an extremity. Exit carelessly. Enter Isabella. Well, madam, what think you of him now, pray? I protest, I begin to fear he is wholly disinterested in what he does for me. On my heart he has no other view but the mere pleasure of doing it and has neither good or bad designs upon me. Ah, oh, dear niece, don't be in fear of both. I'll warrant you. You will know time enough that he is not indifferent. You please me when you tell me so, for if he has any wishes towards me, I know he will not pursue them but with honour. I wish I were as confident of one as t'other. I saw the respectful downcast of his eye when you caught him gazing at you during the music. He, I warrant, was surprised, as if he had been taken stealing your watch. Oh, the undissembled guilty look! But did you observe any such thing, really? I thought you looked most charmingly graceful. How engaging is modesty in a man when one knows there is a great mind within— so tender a confusion, and yet, in other respects, so much himself, so collected, so dauntless, so determined. Ah, niece, there is a sort of bashfulness which is the best engine to carry on a shameless purpose. Some men's modesty serves their wickedness, as hypocrisy gains the respect due to piety. But I will own to you, there is one hopeful symptom— if there could be such a thing as a disinterested lover, but it's all a perplexity, till, till, till... Till what? Till I know whether Mr. Myrtle and Mr. Bevel are really friends or foes, and that I will be convinced of before I sleep, for you shall not be deceived. I'm sure I never shall, if your fears can guard me. In the meantime, I'll wrap myself up in the integrity of my own heart, nor dare to doubt of his. As conscious honour all his actions steers, so conscious innocence dispels my fears. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Conscious Lovers by Richard Steele. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Third Scene Sealand's House Enter Tom, meeting Phyllis. 
Well, Phyllis, what, with a face as if you'd never seen me before? Aside. What a work of art to do now. She has seen some new visitant at the house whose air she has caught, and is resolved to practice them upon me. Numberless are the changes she'll dance through before she'll answer this plain question. Be delete it. Have you delivered my master's letter to your lady? Nay, I know her too well to ask an account of it in an ordinary way. I'll be in my ears as well as she. Well, madam, as unhappy as you are at present pleased to make me, I would not, in the general, be any other than what I am. I would not be a bit wiser, a bit richer, a bit taller, a bit shorter than I am at this instant. Looking steadfastly at her. Did ever anybody doubt, Master Thomas, but that you were extremely satisfied with your sweet self? I am indeed. The thing I have least reason to be satisfied with is my fortune, and I am glad of my poverty. Perhaps if I were rich, I should overlook the finest woman in the world that wants nothing but riches to be thought so. Phyllis, aside. How prettily that was said. But I'll have a great deal more before I say one word. I should perhaps have been stupidly above her had I not been her equal, and by not being her equal never had opportunity of being her slave. I am my master's servant for hire. I am my mistress if from choice, would she but approve my passion. I think it's the first time I ever heard you speak with any sense of anguish, if you really do suffer any. Ah, Phyllis, can you doubt after what you have seen? I know not what I have seen nor what I have heard. But since I am at leisure, you may tell me when you fell in love with me, how you fell in love with me, and what you have suffered, or are ready to suffer for me. Tom, aside. Oh, the unmerciful jade. I am in haste about my master's letter, but I must go through it. Ah, so well I remember when and how and on what occasion I was first surprised. It was on the 1st of April, 1715, I came into Master Seelan's service. I was then a hobbledehoy, and you, a pretty little tight girl, a favourite handmaid of the housekeeper. At that time we neither of us knew what was in us. I remember I was ordered to get out of the window, one pair of stairs, to rub the sashes clean. The person employed on the inner side was your charming self, whom I had never seen before. <laughs> I think I remember the silly accident. What made ye, you oaf, ready to fall down into the street? You know not, I warrant you. You could not guess what surprised me. You took no delight when you immediately grew wanton in your conquest, and put your lips close and breathed upon the glass, and when my lips approached, a dirty cloth you rubbed against my face and hid your beauteous form. When I again drew near, you spit and rubbed and smiled at my undoing. What silly thoughts you men have! We were Pyramus and Thisbe, but ten times harder was my fate. Pyramus could peep only through a wall. I saw her. Saw my Thisbe in all her beauty, but as much kept from her as if a hundred walls between. For there was more. It was her will against me. Would she but yet relent? Oh, Phyllis. Oh, Phyllis, shorten my torment and declare you pity me. I believe it's very sufferable. The pain is not so exquisite, but that you may bear it a little longer. Oh, my charming Phyllis, if all depended on my fair one's will, I could with glory suffer. But, dearest creature, consider our miserable state. How? Miserable? We are miserable to be in love, and under the command of others than those we love. That generous passion in the heart to be sent to and fro on errands, cold, checked, and rated for the meanest trifles. Oh, Phyllis, you don't know how many china cups and glasses my passion for you has made me break. You have broke my fortune as well as my heart. Well, Mr. Thomas... I cannot but own to you that I believe your master writes, and you speak the best of any men in the world. Never was a woman so pleased with a letter as my young lady was with his, and this is the answer to it. Gives him a letter. This was well done, my dearest. Consider, we must strike out some pretty livelihood for ourselves by closing their affairs. It will be nothing for them to give us a little being of our own, some small tenement out of their large possessions. Whatever they give us, it will be more than what they keep for themselves. One acre with Phyllis would be worth a whole county without her. Oh, could I but believe you? If not the utterance, believe the touch of my lips. Kisses her. Ah, there's no contradicting you. How closely you argue, Tom. And will closer in due time. But I must hasten with this letter to hasten towards the possession of you. 
Then, Phyllis, consider how I must be revenged. Look to it, of all your skittishness, shy looks, and at best but coy compliances. Oh, Tom, you grow wanton, and sensual, as my lady calls it. I must not endure it. Oh, for you are a man, an odious, filthy male creature. You should behave, if you had a right sense, or were a man of sense, like Mr. Simberton, with distance and indifference, or, let me see, some other becoming hard word, with seeming in, in, inadvertency, and not rush on one as if you were seizing a prey. But hush, the ladies are coming. Good Tom. Don't kiss me above once, and be gone. Lord, we have been fooling and toying, and not considered the main business of our masters and mistresses. Why, their business is to be fooling and toying as soon as the parchments are ready. Well remembered, parchments. My lady, to my knowledge, is preparing writings between her coxcomb cousin, Simberton, and my mistress though my master has an eye to the parchments already prepared between your master mr bevel and my mistress and i believe my mistress herself has signed and sealed in her heart to mr myrtle did i not bid you to kiss me but once and be gone <laughs> but i know you won't be satisfied no you smooth creature how should i kissing her hand well since you are so humble or so cool as to ravish my hand only i'll take my leave of you like a great lady and you a man of quality they salute formally pox of all this state offers to kiss her more closely no prithee tom mind your business we must follow that interest which will take but endeavour at that which will be most for us and we like most oh here's my young mistress tom taps her neck behind and kisses his fingers go ye liquorish fool exit tom enter lucinda who was that you were hurrying away <laughs> one that i had no mind to part with why did you turn him away then for your ladyship's service to carry your ladyship's letter to his master i could hardly get the rogue away why, has he so little love for his master? No, but he hath so much love for his mistress. But I thought I heard him kiss you. Why did you suffer that? Why, madam, we vulgar take it to be a sign of love. We servants, we poor people, that have nothing but our persons to bestow or treat for, are forced to deal and bargain by way of sample. And therefore, as we have no parchments or wax necessary in our agreements, we squeeze with our hands, and seal with our lips, to ratify vows and promises. But can't you trust one another without such earnest down? We don't think it's safe, any more than you gentry to come together without deeds executed. Thou art a pert merry hussy. <laughs> I wish, madam, that your lover and you were as happy as Tom and your servant are. You grow impertinent. I have done, madam. And I won't ask you what you intend to do with Mr. Myrtle, what your father will do with Mr. Bevel, nor what you all, especially my lady, mean by admitting Mr. Simberton as particularly here as if he were married to you already. Nay, you are married, actually, as far as people of quality are. How is that? You have different beds in the same house. Pshaw! I have a very great value for Mr. Bevel but have absolutely put an end to his pretensions in the letter I gave you for him. But my father in his heart still has a mind to him, were it not for this woman they talk of, and I am apt to imagine he is married to her, or never designs to marry at all. Then, Mr. Myrtle? He had my parents leave to apply to me, and by that he has won me and my affections. Who is to have this body of mine without them, it seems, is nothing to me. My mother says tis indecent for me to let my thoughts stray about the person of my husband. Nay, she says a maid, rigidly virtuous, though she may have been where her lover was a thousand times, should not have made observations enough to know him from another man when she sees him in a third place. That is more than the severity of a nun, for not to see when one may is hardly possible. 
and not to see when one can't is very easy. At this rate, madam, there are a great many who you have not seen who... Mamma says the first time you see your husband should be at the instant he is made so. When your father, with the help of the minister, gives you to him, then you are to see him. Then you are to observe and take notice of him, because then you are to obey him. But does not my lady remember you are to love as well as obey? To love is a passion, it is a desire, and we must have no desires. Oh, I cannot endure the reflection. With what insensibility on my part, with what more than patience have I been exposed and offered to some awkward booby or other in every county of Great Britain? Indeed, madam, I wonder I never heard you speak of it before with this indignation. Every corner of the land has presented me with a wealthy coxcomb. As fast as one treaty has gone off, another has come on, till my name and person have been the tittle-tattle of the whole town. What has this world come to? No shame left, to be bartered for like the beasts of the field, and that in such an instance as coming together to an entire familiarity and union of soul and body. Oh, and this without being so much as well-wishers to each other, but for increase of fortune. But, madam, all these vexations will end very soon in one for all, Mr. Simberton is your mother's kinsman, and three hundred years an older gentleman than any lover you ever had. For which reason, with that of his prodigious large estate, she is resolved on him, and has sent to consult the lawyers accordingly. Nay, has, whether you know it or no, been in treaty with Sir Geoffrey, who, to join in the settlement, has accepted of a sum to do it, and is every moment expected in town for that purpose." How do you get all this intelligence? By an art I have, I thank my stars, beyond all the waiting maids in Great Britain. The art of listening, madam, for your lady's service. I shall soon know as much as you do. Leave me, leave me, Phyllis, be gone. Here, here, I'll turn you out. My mother says I must not converse with my servants, though I must converse with no one else. Except Phyllis. How unhappy are we who were born to great fortunes. No one looks at us with indifference, or acts towards us on the foot of plain dealing. Yet by all I have been heretofore offered to or treated for, I have been used with the most agreeable of all abuses, flattery. But now by this phlegmatic fool I'm used as nothing, or a mere thing. He, forsooth, is too wise, too learned to have any regard for desires, and I know not what the learned oath calls sentiments of love and passion. Here he comes with my mother. It's much if he looks at me, or if he does, takes no more notice of me than of any other movable in the room. Enter Mrs. Sealand and Mr. Simberton. How do I admire this noble, this learned taste of yours, and the worthy regard you have to our own ancient and honourable house, in consulting a means to keep the blood as pure and as regularly descended as may be? Why, really, ma'am? The young women of this age are treated with discourses of such a tendency, and their imaginations so bewildered in flesh and blood, that a man of reason can't talk to be understood. They have no ideas of happiness but what are more gross than the gratification of hunger and thirst. Lucinda, aside. With how much reflection he is a coxcomb. And in truth, ma'am, I have considered it a most brutal custom that persons of the first character in the world should go as ordinarily and with as little shame to bed as to dinner with one another. They proceed to the propagation of the species as openly as to the preservation of the individual. Lucinda, aside. She that willingly goes to bed to thee must have no shame, I'm sure. Oh, cousin Simberton, Cousin Simberton, how abstracted, how refined is your sense of things! But, indeed, it is too true there is nothing so ordinary as to say, in the best-governed families, my master and lady have gone to bed. One does not know, but it might have been said of oneself. Hiding her face with her fan. Lysurgus, ma'am, instituted otherwise. Among the Lacedaemonians, the whole female world was pregnant, but none but the mothers themselves knew by whom. Their meetings were secret, 
and the amorous congress always by stealth and no such professed doings between the sexes as are tolerated among us under the audacious word marriage oh had i lived in those days and been a matron of sparta one might with less indecency have had ten children according to that modest institution than one under the confusion of our modern barefaced manner lucinda aside and yet poor woman she has gone through the whole ceremony and here i stand a melancholy proof of it we will talk then of business that girl walking about the room there is to be your wife she has i confess no ideas no sentiments that speak her born of a thinking mother i have observed her her lively look free air and disengaged countenance speak her very very what if you please ma'am to set her a little that way lucinda say nothing to him you are not a match for him when you are married you may speak to such a husband when you are spoken to but i am disposing of you above yourself every way ma'am you cannot but observe the inconveniences i expose myself to in hopes that your ladyship will be the consort of my better part as for the young woman she is rather an impediment than a help to a man of letters and speculation ma'am there is no reflection no philosophy can at all times subdue the sensitive life but the animal shall sometimes carry away the man ha i the vermilion of her lips pray don't talk of me thus the pretty enough pant of her bosom sir madam don't you hear him her forward chest intolerable high health the grave easy impudence of him proud heart stupid coxcomb i say madam her impatience while we are looking at her throws out all attractions her arms her neck what a spring in her step don't you run me over thus you strange unaccountable what an elasticity in her veins and arteries i have no veins no arteries oh child hear him he talks finely he's a scholar he knows what you have the speaking invitation of her shape the gathering of herself up and the indignation you see in the pretty little thing now i am considering her on this occasion but as one that is to be pregnant lucinda aside the familiar learned unseasonable puppy and pregnant undoubtedly she will be yearly i fear i shan't for many years have discretion enough to give her one fallow season monster there's no bearing it the hideous sot there's no enduring it to be thus surveyed like a steed at sale at sale she's very illiterate but she's very well limbed too turn her in i see what she is Ooh. exit lucinda in a rage go you creature i am ashamed of you no harm done you know ma'am the better sort of people as i observe to you treat by their lawyers of weddings adjusting himself at the glass and the woman in the bargain like the mansion house in the sale of the estate is thrown in and what that is whether good or bad is not at all considered i grant it and therefore make no demand for her youth and beauty and every other accomplishment as the common world think em because she's not polite ma'am i know your exalted understanding abstracted as it is from vulgar prejudices will not be offended when i declare to you i marry to have an heir to my estate and not to beget a colony or a plantation 
this young woman's beauty and constitution will demand provision for a tenth child at least mrs sealand aside with all that wit and learning how considerate what an economist sir i cannot make her any other than she is or say she is much better than the other young women of this age or fit for much besides being a mother but i have given directions for the marriage settlements and sir geoffrey simberton's counsel is to meet ours here at this hour concerning this joining in the deed which when executed makes you capable of settling what is due to lucinda's fortune herself as i told you i say nothing of no no indeed ma'am it is not usual and i must depend upon my own reflection and philosophy not to overstock my family i cannot help her cousin simberton but she is for aught i see as well as the daughter of anybody else that is very true ma'am enter a servant who whispers mrs sealand the lawyers are come and now we are to hear what they have resolved as to the point whether it's necessary that sir geoffrey should join in the settlement as being what they call in the remainder but good cousin you must have patience with them these lawyers i am told are of a different kind one is what they call a chamber counsel the other a pleader the conveyancer is slow from an imperfection in his speech and therefore shunned the bar but extremely passionate and impatient of contradiction the other is as warm as he but has a tongue so voluble and a head so conceited he will suffer nobody to speak but himself you mean old sergeant target and councillor bramble i have heard of em the same show in the gentleman exit servant re-enter servant introducing myrtle and tom disguised as bramble and target gentlemen this is the party concerned mr simberton and i hope you have considered of the matter yes madam we have agreed that it must be by indent dent 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 yes madame mr sergeant and myself have agreed as he is pleased to inform you that it must be an indenture tripartite and tripartite let it be for sir geoffrey must needs be a party old simberton in the year sixteen nineteen says in that the ancient roll in mr sergeant's hands as recourse thereto being had will more at large appear yes and by the deeds of your hands it appears that mr sergeant i beg of you to make no inferences upon what is in our custody but speak to the titles in your own deeds i shall not show that deed till my client is in town you know best your own methods the single question is whether the entail is such that my cousin sir geoffrey is necessary in this affair yes as to the lordship of tretriplet but not as to the messwidge of grim gribber i say that gur gur that gur gur grim gribber grim gribber is in us that is to say the remainder thereof as well as that of tre tre triplet you go upon the deed of sir ralph made in the mid of the last century precedent to that which old simberton made over the remainder and made it to pass to the heirs in general by which your client comes in and i question whether the remainder even of tri triplet is in him but we are willing to waive that and give him a valuable consideration but we shall not purchase what is in us for ever as grim Gribber is at the rate as we guard against the contingent of mr simberton having no son then we know sir geoffrey is the first of the collateral male line in this family yet it's a gur is i apprehend you very well and your argument might be a force and we would be inclined to hear that in all its parts but sir i see very plainly what you are going into i tell you it is as probable a contingent that sir geoffrey may die before mr simberton 
as that he may outlive him. Sir, we are not ripe for that yet, but I must say... Sir, I allow you the whole extent of that argument, but that will go no farther than as to the claimants under old Simberton. I am of the opinion that, according to the instruction of Sir Ralph, he could not dock the entail and then create a new estate for the heirs general. Sir, I have not patience to be told that when... Uh, 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 I will allow it you, Mr. Sergeant, but there must be the word heirs forever to make such an estate as you pretend. I must be impartial, though you are counsel for my side of the question. Were it not that you are so good as to allow him what he has not said, I should think it very hard you should answer him without hearing him. But, gentlemen, I believe you have both considered this matter and are firm in your different opinions. T'were better, therefore, you proceeded according to the particular sense of each of you and gave your thoughts distinctly in writing. And do you see, sirs, pray let me have a copy of what you say in English. Why, what is it all we have been saying? In English? Oh! But I forget myself, you're a wit. But, however, to please you, sir, you shall have it, in as plain terms as the law will admit of. I would have it, sir, without delay. That, sir, the law will not admit of. The courts are sitting in Westminster, and I am this moment obliged to be at every one of them, and t'would be wrong if I should not be in the hall to attend one of them at least. The rest would take it ill else. Therefore, I must leave what I have said to Mr. Sergeant's consideration, and I will digest his arguments on my part, and you shall hear from me again, sir. Exit Bramble. Agreed, agreed. Mr. Bramble is very quick. He parted a little abruptly. He could not bear my argument. I pinched him to the quick about that. Grr. 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 I saw that, for he durst not so much as hear you. I shall send to you, Mr. Sergeant, as soon as Sir Geoffrey comes to town, and then I hope all may be adjusted. I shall be at my chambers at my usual hours. Exit. Ma'am, if you please, I'll now attend you to the tea-table, where I shall hear from your ladyship reason and good sense, after all this law and gibberish. <laughs> Tis a wonderful thing, sir, that men of professions do not study to talk the substance of what they have to say in the language of the rest of the world. Sure they'd find their account in it. They might, perhaps, ma'am, with people of your good sense but with the generality t'would never do. The vulgar would have no respect for truth and knowledge if they were exposed to naked view. Truth is too simple, of all art bereaved. Since the world will, why let it be deceived? Exeunt. End of Act 3 Act Four of The Conscious Lovers by Richard Steele. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fourth. Scene One. Bevel Junior's Lodgings. Bevel Junior with a letter in his hand, followed by Tom. Upon my life, sir, I know nothing of the matter. I never opened my lips to Master Myrtle about anything of your honour's letter to Madame Lucinda. What's the fool in such a fright for? I don't suppose you did. What I would know is whether Mr. Myrtle shows any suspicion or asked you any questions to lead you to say casually that you had carried any such letter for me this morning. Why, sir, if he did ask me any questions, how could I help it? I don't say you could, Oaf. I'm not questioning you, but him. What did he say to you? Why, sir, when I came to his chambers to be dressed for the lawyer's part your honour was pleased to put me upon, he asked me if I had been at Master Seelan's this morning. So I told him, sir, I often went thither. Because, sir, if I had not said that, he 
might have thought there was something more in my going now than at another time. Very well. Aside. The fellow's caution, I find, has given him this jealousy. Did he ask you no other questions? Yes, sir. Now I remember, as we came away in the hackney coach from Master Seelands, Tom, says he, as I came in to your master this morning, he bade you go for an answer to a letter he had sent. Pray did you bring him any, says he. Ah, says I, sir, your honour is pleased to joke with me. You have a mind to know whether I can keep a secret or no. And so, by showing him you could, you told him you had one? Sir... What mean actions does jealousy make a man stoop to? How poorly has he used art with a servant to make him betray his master? Well, and when did he give you this letter for me? Sir, so he, he writ it before he pulled off his lawyer's gown at his own chambers. Very well, and what did he say when you brought him my answer to it? He looked a little out of humour, sir, and said it was very well. I knew he would be grave upon it. Wait without... Hmm. Gad, I don't like this. I'm afraid we're all in the wrong box here. Exit Tom. I put on a serenity while my fellow was present, but I have never been more thoroughly disturbed. This hot man, to write me a challenge, on supposed artificial dealing, when I professed myself his friend, I can live contented without glory, but I cannot suffer shame. What's to be done? But first... Let me consider Lucinda's letter again. Reads. Sir, I hope it is consistent with the laws a woman ought to impose upon herself to acknowledge that your manner of declining a treaty of marriage in our family and desiring the refusal may come from me has something more engaging in it than the courtship of him who, I fear, will fall to my lot except your friend exerts himself for our common safety and happiness, I have reasons for desiring Mr. Myrtle may not know of this letter till hereafter, and I am your most obliged humble servant, Lucinda Sealand. Well, but the postscript... Reads. I won't, upon second thoughts, hide anything from you, but my reason for concealing this is that Mr. Myrtle has a jealousy in his temper which gives me some terrors, but my esteem for him inclines me to hope that only an ill effect which sometimes accompanies a tender love and what may be cured by a careful and unblameable conduct. Thus has this lady made me her friend and confidant and put herself in a kind under my protection. I cannot tell him immediately the purport of her letter except I would cure him of the violent and untractable passion of jealousy and so serve him and her by disobeying her in the article of secrecy more than I should by complying with her directions. But then this duelling, which custom is imposed upon every man who would live with reputation and honour in the world, how must I preserve myself from imputations there? He'll, forsooth, call it or think it fear if I explain without fighting. But his letter, I'll read it again. Reads. Sir, you have used me basely in corresponding and carrying on a treaty where you told me you were indifferent. I have changed my sword since I saw you, which advertisement I thought proper to send you against the next meeting between you and the injured, Charles Myrtle. Enter Tom. Master Myrtle, sir, would your honour please to see him? Why, you stupid creature, let Mr. Myrtle wait at my lodgings. Show him up. Exit, Tom. Well, I am resolved upon my carriage to him. He is in love, and in every circumstance of life a little distrustful, which I must allow for. But here he is. Enter Tom, introducing Myrtle. Sir, I am extremely obliged to you for this honour. To Tom. But, sir, you, with your very discerning face, leave the room. Exit Tom. Well, Mr. Myrtle, your commands with me? The time, the place, our long acquaintance, and many other circumstances which affect me on this occasion oblige me, without further ceremony or conference, to desire you would not only, as you already have, acknowledge the receipt of my letter, but also comply with the request in it. I must have farther notice taken of my message than these half lines. I have yours. I shall be at home. Sir, I own I have received a letter from you in a very unusual style, 
but as i design everything in this matter shall be your own action your own seeking i shall understand nothing but what you are pleased to confirm face to face and i have already forgot the contents of your epistle this cool manner is very agreeable to the abuse you have already made of my simplicity and frankness and i see your moderation tends to your advantage and not mine to your own safety not consideration of your friend my own safety mr myrtle your own safety mr bevel look you mr myrtle there's no disguising that i understand what you would be at but sir you know i have often dared to disapprove of the decisions a tyrant custom has introduced to the breach of all laws both divine and human mr bevel mr bevel it would be a good first principle in those who have so tender a conscience that way to have as much abhorrence of doing injuries as f as what as fear of answering for him as fear of answering for him but that apprehension is just or blamable according to the object of that fear i have often told you in confidence of heart i abhorred the daring to offend the author of life and rushing into his presence i say by the very same act to commit the crime against him and immediately to urge on to his tribunal mr bevel i must tell you this coolness this gravity this show of conscience shall never cheat me of my mistress you have indeed the best excuse for life the hopes of possessing lucinda but consider sir i have as much a reason to be weary of it if i am to lose her and my first attempt to recover her shall be to let her see the dauntless man who is to be her guardian and protector sir show me but the least glimpse of argument that i am authorized by my own hand to vindicate any lawless insult of this nature and i will show thee to chastise thee hardly deserves the name of courage slight inconsiderate man there is mr myrtle no such terror in quick anger and you shall you know not why be cool as you have you know not why been warm is the woman one loves so little an occasion for anger you perhaps who know not what it is to love who have your ready your commodious your foreign trinket for your loose hours and from your fortune your specious outward carriage and other lucky circumstances as easy a way to the possession of a woman of honour you know nothing of what it is to be alarmed to be distracted with anxiety and terror of losing more than life your marriage happy man goes on like common business and in the interim you have your rambling captive your indian princess for your soft moments of dalliance your convenient your ready indiana you have touched me beyond the patience of a man and i am excusable in the guard of innocence or from the infirmity of human nature which can bear no more to accept your invitation and observe your letter sir i'll attend you enter tom uh, did you call sir uh, i thought you did I, I heard you speak aloud yes go call a coach sir master uh, master myrtle friends gentlemen what do you mean i am but a servant or call a coach exit tom a long pause walking sullenly by each other aside shall i though provoked to the uttermost recover myself at the entrance of a third person and at my servant too and not have respect enough to all i have ever been receiving from infancy the obligation to the best of fathers to an unhappy virgin too whose life depends on mine shutting the door to myrtle i have thank heaven had time to recollect myself and shall not for fear of what such a rash man as you think of me keep longer unexplained the false appearances under which your infirmity of temper makes you suffer when perhaps too much regard to a false point of honour makes me prolong the suffering i am sure mr bevel cannot doubt but i had rather have satisfaction from his innocence than his sword why then would you ask it first that way consider you kept your temper yourself no longer till i spoke to the disadvantage of her you loved true but let me tell you 
I have saved you from the most exquisite distress. Even though you had succeeded in the dispute, I know you so well that I am sure to have found this letter about a man you had killed would have been worse than death to yourself. Read it. Aside. When he is thoroughly mortified, and shame has got the better of jealousy, when he has seen himself throughly, he will deserve to be assisted towards obtaining Lucinda. Myrtle, aside. <gasps> With what a superiority he has turned the injury on me. As the aggressor, I begin to fear I have been too far transported. A treaty in our family? Is not that saying too much? I shall relapse, but I find, on the postscript, something like jealousy. With what face can I see my benefactor, my advocate, whom I have treated like a betrayer? Oh, Bethel, with what words shall I? There needs none. To convince is much more than to conquer. But can you? You have all paid the inquietude you gave me. In the change I see in you toward me, alas, what machines are we? Thy face is altered to that of another man, to that of my companion, my friend. That I could be such a precipitant wretch. Pray no more. Let me reflect on how many friends have died by the hands of friends for want of temper. And you must give me leave to say again and again how much I am beholden to that superior spirit you have subdued me with. What had become of one of us, or perhaps both, had you been as weak as I was, and as incapable of reason? I congratulate to us both the escape from ourselves, and hope the memory of it will make us dearer friends than ever. Dear Bevel, your friendly conduct has convinced me that there is nothing manly but what is conducted by reason and agreeable to the practice of virtue and justice. And yet how many have been sacrificed to that idol, the unreasonable opinion of men? Nay, they are so ridiculous in it that they often use their swords against each other with disassembled anger and real fear. Betrayed by honor and compelled by shame, they hazard being to preserve a name, nor dare inquire into the dread mistake till plunged in sad eternity they wake. Exeunt. Scene 2, St. James's Park. Enter Sir John Bevel and Mr. Sealand. Give me leave, however, Mr. Sealand, as we are upon a treaty for uniting our families, to mention only the business of an ancient house. Genealogy and descent are to be of some consideration in an affair of this sort. Genealogy and descent? So there has been in our family a very large one. There was Galfred, the father of Edward, the father of Ptolemy, the father of Crassus, the father of Earl Richard, the father of Henry the Marquis, the father of Duke John. What, do you rave, Mr. Sealand? All these great names in your family? These? Yes, sir, I've heard my father name of all, and more. Aye, sir, and did he say they were all in your family? Yes, sir, he kept them all. He was the greatest cocker in England. He said Duke John won him many battles, and never lost one. Oh, sir, your servant, you are laughing at my laying any stress upon descent. But I must tell you, sir... I never knew any one but he that wanted that advantage turn it into ridicule. And I never knew any one who had better advantages put that into his account. But, Sir John, value yourself as you please upon your ancient house, and talk freely of everything you are pleased to put into your bill of rates on this occasion. Yet, sir, I have made no objections to your son's family. Tis his morals that I doubt. Sir... I can't help saying that what might injure a citizen's credit may be no stain to a gentleman's honour. Sir John, the honour of a gentleman is liable to be tainted by as small a matter as the credit of a trader. We are talking of a marriage, and in such a case the father of a young woman will not think it an addition to the honour or credit of her lover that he is a keeper. Mr. Sealand. Don't take upon you to spoil my son's marriage with any woman else. Sir John, let him apply to any woman else, and have as many mistresses as he pleases. My son, sir, is a discreet and sober gentleman. 
sir i never saw a man that wenched soberly and discreetly that ever left it off the decency absorbed in the practice hides even from the sinner the iniquity of it they pursue it not that their appetites hurry em away but i warrant you because tis their opinion they may do it were what you suspect a truth do you design to keep your daughter a virgin till you find a man unblemished that way sir as much as sit as you take me for i know the town and the world and give me leave to say that we merchants are a species of gentry that have grown into the world this last century and are as honourable and almost as useful as you landed folks that have always thought yourselves so much above us for your trading forsooth is extended no farther than a load of hay or a fat ox you are pleasant people indeed because you are generally bred up to be lazy therefore i warrant you industry is dishonourable be not offended sir let us go back to our point oh not at all offended but i don't love to leave any part of the account unclosed look you sir john comparisons are odious and more particularly so on occasions of this kind when we are projecting races that are to be made out of both sides of the comparisons but my son sir is in the eye of the world a gentleman of merit i own to you i think him so but sir john i am a man exercised and experienced in chances and disasters i lost in my earlier years a very fine wife and with her a poor little infant this makes me perhaps over cautious to preserve the second bounty of providence to me and be as careful as i can of this child you'll pardon me my poor girl sir is as valuable to me as your boasted son to you why that's one very good reason mr sealand why i wish my son had her there is nothing but this strange lady here this incognita that can be objected to him here and there a man falls in love with an artful creature and gives up all the motives of life to that one passion a man of my son's understanding cannot be supposed to be one of them very wise men have been so enslaved and when a man marries with one of them upon his hands whether moved from the demand of the world or slighter reasons such a husband soils with his wife for a month perhaps and then good be way madam the show's over ah john dryden points out such a husband to a hare when he says and while abroad so prodigal the dolt is poor spouse at home as ragged as a colt is now in plain terms sir i shall not care to have my poor girl turned a grazing and that must be the case when but pray consider sir my son look you sir i'll make the matter short this unknown lady as i told you is all the objection i have to him but one way or other he is or has been certainly engaged to her i am therefore resolved this very afternoon to visit her now from her behaviour or appearance i shall soon be let into what i may fear or hope for sir i am very confident there can be nothing inquired into relating to my son that will not upon being understood turn to his advantage i hope that as sincerely as you believe it sir john bevel when i am satisfied in this great point if your son's conduct answers the character you give him i shall wish your alliance more than that of any gentleman in great britain and so your servant exit he is gone in a way but barely civil but his great wealth and the merit of his only child the heiress of it are not to be lost for a little peevishness enter humphrey ah humphrey you are come in a seasonable minute i want to talk to thee and to tell thee that my head and heart are on the rack about my son sir you may trust his discretion i am sure you may why i do believe i may 
and yet I'm in a thousand fears when I lay this vast wealth before me. When I consider his prepossessions, either generous to a folly in an honorable love, or abandoned past redemption in a vicious one, and from the one or the other, his insensibility to the fairest prospects towards doubling our estate, a father who knows how useful wealth is, and how necessary even to those who despise it. I say a father, Humphrey, a father cannot bear it. Be not transported, sir. You will grow incapable of taking any resolution in your perplexity. Yet, as angry as I am with him, I would not have him surprised in anything. This mercantile rough man may go grossly into the examination of this matter, and talk to the gentlewoman so as to... No, I hope not in an abrupt manner. No, I hope not. Why, dost thou know anything of her, or of him, or of anything of it, or all of it? Uh, my dear master, I know so much that I told him th this very day you had reason to be secretly out of humor about her. Did you go so far? Well, what said he to that? His words were looking upon me steadfastly. Humphrey, says he, that woman is a woman of honor. How? Do you think he is married to her? or designs to marry her? I can say nothing to the latter, but he says he can marry no one without your consent while you are living. If he said so much, I know he scorns to break his word with me. I am sure of that. You are sure of that? Well, that's some comfort. Then I have nothing to do but to see the bottom of this matter during this present ruffle. Oh, Humphrey! You are not ill, I hope, sir. Yes, a man is very ill that's in a very ill humor. To be a father is to be in care for one whom you oftener disoblige than please by that very care. Oh, that sons could know the duty to a father before they themselves are fathers. But, perhaps, you'll say now that I am one of the happiest fathers in the world? But, I assure you, that of the very happiest is not a condition to be envied. Sir, your pain arises not from the thing itself, but your particular sense of it. You are over-fond. Nay, give me leave to say you are unjustly apprehensive from your fondness. My master Bevel never disobliged you, and he will, I know he will, do everything you ought to expect. He won't take all this money with the girl. For aught I know, he will, forsooth, have so much moderation as to think he ought not to force his liking for any consideration. He is to marry her, not you. He is to live with her, not you, sir. I know not what to think. But I know nothing can be more miserable than to be in this doubt. Follow me. I must come to some resolution. Exeunt. Scene 3. Bevel Junior's lodgings. Enter Tom and Phyllis. Well, madam, if you must speak with Master Myrtle, you shall. He is now with my master in the library. But you must leave me alone with him, for he can't make me a present, nor I so handsomely take anything from him before you. It would not be decent. It will be very decent indeed for me to retire and leave my mistress with another man. He is a gentleman, and will treat one properly. I believe so. But, however, I won't be far off, and therefore will venture to trust you. I'll call him to you. Exit Tom. What a deal of pother and sputter here is between my mistress and Mr. Myrtle, from mere punctilio. I could, any hour of the day, get her to her lover, and I would do it. But she, forsooth, would allow no plot to get him. But, if he can come to her, I know she would be glad of it. I must, therefore, do her an acceptable violence, and surprise her into his arms. I am sure I go by the best rule imaginable. If she were my maid, I should think her the best servant in the world for doing so by me. Enter Myrtle and Tom. Oh, sir, you and Mr. Bevel are fine gentlemen to let a lady remain under such difficulties as my poor mistress, and no attempt to set her at liberty— or release her from the danger of being instantly married to Simberton. Tom has been telling, but what is to be done? 
What is to be done when a man can't come at his mistress? Why, can't you fire our house or the next house to us to make us run out and you take us? How, Mrs. Phillips? Aye, let me see that rogue deny to fire a house, make a riot, or any other little thing, when there were no other way to come at me. I am obliged to you, madam. Why, don't we hear every day of people hanging themselves for love? And won't they venture the hazard of being hanged for love? Ah, were I a man. What manly thing would you have me undertake, according to your ladyship's notion of a man? Only be at once what, one time or other, you may be, and wish to be, or must be. Dear girl, talk plainly to me, and consider I, in my condition, can't be in very good humor. You say to be at once what I must be. Ay, ay, I mean no more than to be an old man. I saw you do it very well at the masquerade. In a word, old Sir Geoffrey Simberton is every hour expected in town to join in the deeds and settlements for marrying Mr. Simberton. He is half blind, half lame, half deaf, half dumb, though as to his passions and desires, he is as warm and ridiculous as when in the heat of youth. Come to the business, and don't keep the gentleman in suspense for the pleasure of being courted as you serve me. I saw you at the masquerade act such a one to perfection. Go and put on that very habit, and come to our house as Sir Geoffrey. There's not one there but myself knows his person. I was born in the parish where he is lord of the manor. I have seen him often, and often at church in the country. Do not hesitate, but come hither. They will think you bring certain security against Mr. Myrtle. And you bring Mr. Myrtle. Leave the rest to me. I leave this with you and expect. They don't, I told you, know you. They think you out of town. Would you had as good be for ever if you lose this opportunity? I must be gone. I know I am wanted at home. My dear Phyllis. <coughs> Catches and kisses her and gives her money. Ah, fie! My kisses are not my own. You have committed violence, but I'll carry him to the right owner. Tom kisses her. To Tom. Come see me downstairs. And leave the lover to think of his last game for the prize. Exeunt Tom and Phyllis. I think I will instantly attempt this wild expedient. The extravagance of it will make me less suspected, and it will give me opportunity to assert my own right to Lucinda, without whom I cannot live. But I am so mortified at this conduct of mine towards poor Bevel. He must think meanly of me. I know not how to reassume myself and be in the spirit enough for such an adventure as this. Yet I must attempt it, if it be only to be near Lucinda, under her present perplexities, and sure, the next delight to transport with the fair is to relieve her in her house of care. Exit. End of Act Four. Act Five of The Conscious Lovers by Richard Steele. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fifth. Scene One. Sealand's House. Enter Phyllis with lights before Myrtle, disguised like old Sir Geoffrey, supported by Mrs. Sealand, Lucinda, and Simberton. Now I have seen you thus far, Sir Geoffrey, will you excuse me a moment while I give my necessary orders for your accommodation? Exit Mrs. Sealand. I have not seen you, Cousin Simberton, since you were ten years old, and as it is incumbent on you to keep up our name and family, I shall, upon very reasonable terms, join with you in a settlement to that purpose. Though I must tell you, Cousin, this is the first merchant that has married into our house. Lucinda. Aside. Do, Sonam. Am I a merchant because my father is? But is he directly a traitor at this time? There's no hiding the disgrace, sir. He trades to all parts of the world. We never had one in our family before who descended from persons that did anything. 
sir since it is a girl that they have i am for the honour of my family willing to take it in again and to sink her into our name and no harm done disprudently and generously resolved is this the young thing yes sir phyllis to lucinda good madam don't be out of humour but let them run the utmost of their extravagance hear them out can't i see her nearer my eyes are but weak phyllis to lucinda beside i am sure the uncle has something worth your notice i'll take care to get off the young one and leave you to observe what may be wrought out of the old one for your good exit ma'am this old gentleman your great uncle desires to be introduced to you and to see you nearer approach sir by your leave young lady puts on spectacles cousin simberton she has exactly that sort of neck and bosom for which my sister gertrude was so admired in the year sixty one before the french dresses first discovered anything in women below the chin lucinda aside what a very odd situation i am in though i cannot but be diverted at the extravagance of their humours equally unsuitable to their age chin quotha i don't believe my passionate lover there knows whether i have one or not <laughs> madam i would not willingly offend but i have a better glass pulls out a large one enter phyllis phyllis to simberton sir my lady desires to show you the apartment that she intends for sir geoffrey well sir by that time you will have sufficiently gazed and sunned yourself in the beauties of my spouse there I will wait on you again. Exit Simberton and Phyllis. Were it not, madame, that I might be troublesome, there is something of importance, though we are alone, which I would say more safe from being heard. Lucinda, aside. There is something in this old fellow, methinks, that raises my curiosity. To be free, madame, I as heartily condemn this kinsman of mine as you do and i am sorry to see so much beauty and merit devoted by your parents to so insensible a possessor surprising i hope then sir you will not contribute to the wrong you are so generous as to pity whatever may be the interest of your family this hand of mine shall never be employed to sign anything against your good and happiness i am sorry sir it is not in my power to make you proper acknowledgments but there is a gentleman in the world whose gratitude will i am sure be worthy of the favour all the thanks i desire madame are in your power to give name them and command them only madame that the first time you are alone with your lover you will with open arms receive him as willingly as his heart could wish it thus then he claims your promise oh lucinda oh a cheat a cheat a cheat hush tis i tis i your lover myrtle himself madame oh bless me what a rashness and folly to surprise me so but hush my mother enter mrs sealand simperton and phyllis how now what's the matter oh madam as soon as you left the room my uncle fell into a sudden fit and and so i cried out for help to support him and conduct him to his chamber that was kindly done alas sir how do you find yourself never was taken in so odd a way in my life pray lead me oh i was talking here pray carry on to my cousin simberton's young lady mrs sealand aside my cousin simberton's young lady how zealous he is even in his extremity for the match a right simberton simberton and lucinda lead him as one in pain Pox uncle will you pull my ear off pray uncle you will squeeze me to death no matter no matter he knows not what he does come sir shall i help you out by no means i'll trouble nobody but my young cousins here they lead him off but pray madam 
Does your ladyship intend that Mr. Simberton shall really marry my young mistress at last? I don't think he likes her. That's not material. Men of his speculation are above desires. But be as it may, now I have given old Sir Geoffrey the trouble of coming up to sign and seal, with what countenance can I be off? As well as with twenty others, madam. It is the glory and honour of a great fortune to live in continual treaties and still to break off. It looks great, madam. True, Phyllis, yet to return our blood again into the Simbertons is an honour not to be rejected. But were you not saying that Sir John Beville's creature, Humphrey, has been with Mr. Sealand? Yes, madam. I overheard them agree that Mr. Sealand should go himself and visit this unknown lady that Mr. Beville is so great with, and if he found nothing there to fright him, then Mr. Beville should still marry my young mistress. How? Nay, then he shall find she is my daughter as well as his. I'll follow him this instant and take the whole family along with me. The disputed power of disposing of my own daughter shall be at an end this very night. I'll live no longer in anxiety for a little hussy that hurts my appearance wherever I carry her, and for whose sake I seem to be at all regarded, and that in the best of my days. Indeed, madam, if she were married, your ladyship might very well be taken for Mr. Sealand's daughter. Nay, when the chit has not been with me, I have heard the man say as much. I'll no longer cut off the greatest pleasure of a woman's life, the shining in assemblies, by her forward anticipation of the respect that's due to her superior. She shall down to Simberton Hall. She shall. She shall. I hope, madam, I shall stay with your ladyship. Thou shalt, Phyllis, and I'll place thee then more about me. But order chairs immediately. I'll be gone this minute. Exeunt. Scene two. Charing Cross. Enter Mr. Sealand and Humphrey. I am very glad, Mr. Humphrey, that you agree with me that it is for our common good I should look thoroughly into this matter. I am indeed of that opinion, for there is no artifice, nothing concealed in our family which ought in justice to be known. I need not desire you, sir, to treat the lady with care and respect. Master Humphrey, I shall not be rude, though I design to be a little abrupt, and come into the matter at once, to see how she will bear upon a surprise. That's the door, sir. I wish you success. While Humphrey speaks, Sealand consults his table-book. I am less concerned what happens there, because I hear Mr. Myrtle is well lodged as old Sir Geoffrey, so I am willing to let this gentleman employ himself here to give them time at home, for I am sure it is necessary for the quiet of our family Lucinda were disposed of out of it, since Mr. Bevel's inclination is so much otherwise engaged. Exit. I think this is the door. Knocks. I'll carry this matter with an air of authority, to inquire, though I make an errand to begin discourse. Knocks again, and enter a footboy. So, young man, is your lady within? Alack, sir, I am but a country boy. I don't know whether she is or no, but, um, you stay a bit. I'll go away and ask the gentlewoman that's with her. Why, sirrah, though you are a country boy, you can see, can't you? You know whether she is at home when you see her, don't you? Nay, nay, I'm not such a country lad neither, master, to think she's at home because I see her. I have been in town but a month, and I lost one place already for believing my own eyes. Why, Sarah, have you learned to lie already? Ah, master, things that are lies in the country are not lies at London. I begin to know my business a little better than so. But, um... You please to walk in. I'll call a gentleman to you that can tell you for certain. She can make bold to ask my lady herself. Oh, then she is within, I find, though you dare not say so. Nay, nay, that's neither here nor there. 
What's matter whether she's within or no, if she has not a mind to see anybody? I can't tell, sirrah, whether you are arch or simple. But, however, get me a direct answer, and here's a shilling for you. Will you please walk in? I'll see what I can do for you. I see you will be fit for your business in time, child. But I expect to meet with nothing but extraordinaries in such a house. Such a house? Sir, you haven't seen it yet. Pray walk in. Sir, I'll wait upon you. Exeunt. Scene 3. Indiana's house. Enter Isabella. What anxiety do I feel for this poor creature? What will be the end of her? Such a languishing, unreserved passion for a man that at last must certainly leave or ruin her, and perhaps both. Then the aggravation of the distress is that she does not believe he will. Not but, I must own, if they are both what they would seem, they are made for one another, as much as Adam and Eve were, for there is no other of their kind but themselves. Enter boy. So, Daniel, what news with you? Madam, there's a gentleman below who would speak with my lady. Sir, don't you know Mr. Bevel yet? Madam, tis not the gentleman who comes every day and asks for you, and won't go in till he knows whether you are with her or no. Ha! That's a particular I did not know before. Well, be it who it will, let him come up to me. Exit boy, and re-enters with Mr. Sealand. Isabella looks amazed. Madam, I can't blame your being a little surprised to see a perfect stranger make a visit, and... I am indeed surprised. Aside. I see he does not know me. You are very prettily lodged here, madam. In truth, it seems you have everything in plenty. Aside and looking about. A thousand a year, I warrant you, upon this pretty nest of rooms, and the dainty one within them. Isabella, apart. Twenty years, it seems, have less effect in the alteration of a man of thirty than of a girl of fourteen. He's almost still the same. But alas, I find, by other men, as well as himself, I am not what I was. As soon as he spoke, I was convinced twas he. How shall I contain my surprise and satisfaction? He must not know me yet. Madam, I hope I don't give you any disturbance. But there is a young lady here with whom I have a particular business to discourse, and I hope she will admit me to that favour. Why, sir, have you had any notice concerning her? I wonder who could give it you. That, madam, is fit only to be communicated to herself. Well, sir, you shall see her. Aside. I find he knows nothing yet, nor shall from me. I am resolved I will observe this interlude, this sport of nature and of fortune. You shall see her presently, sir, for now I am as a mother and will trust her with you. Exit. As a mother? All right. That's the old phrase for one of these commode ladies, who lend out beauty for hire to young gentlemen that have pressing occasions. But here comes the precious lady herself. In troth, a very sightly woman. Enter Indiana. I am told, sir, you have some affair that requires your speaking with me. Yes, madam. There came to my hands a bill drawn by Mr. Bevel, which is payable to-morrow, and he, in the intercourse of business, sent it to me, who have cash of his, and desired me to send a servant with it. But I have made bold to bring you the money myself. Sir, was that necessary? No, madam, but to be free with you, the fame of your beauty, and the regard which Mr. Bevel is a little too well known to have for you, excited my curiosity too well known to have for me your sober appearance sir which my friend described made me expect no rudeness or absurdity at least who's there sir if you pay the money to a servant twill be as well 
pray madam be not offended i came hither on an innocent nay a virtuous design and if you will have patience to hear me it may be as useful to you as you are in a friendship with mr bevel as to my only daughter whom i was this day disposing of you make me hope sir i have mistaken you i am composed again be free say on aside what i am afraid to hear i feared indeed an unwarranted passion here but i did not think it was in abuse of so worthy an object so accomplished a lady as your sense and mean bespeak but the youth of our age care not what merit or virtue they bring to shame so they gratify sir you are going into very great errors but as you are pleased to say you see something in me that has changed at least the colour of your suspicions so has your appearance altered mine and made me earnestly attentive to what has any way concerned you to inquire into my affairs and character how sensibly and with what an air she talks good sir be seated and tell me tenderly keep all your suspicions concerning me alive that you may in a proper and prepared way acquaint me why the care of your daughter obliges a person of your seeming worth and fortune to be thus inquisitive about a wretched helpless friendless weeping but i beg your pardon though i am an orphan your child is not and your concern for her it seems has brought you hither i'll be composed pray go on sir how could mr bevel be such a monster to injure such a woman no sir you wrong him he has not injured me my support is from his bounty bounty when gluttons give high prices for delicates they are prodigious bountiful still still you will persist in that error but my own fears tell me all you are the gentleman i suppose for whose happy daughter he is designed a husband by his good father and he has perhaps consented to the overture he was here this morning dressed beyond his usual plainness nay more sumptuously and he is to be perhaps this night a bridegroom i own he was intended such but madam on your account i have determined to defer my daughter's marriage till i am satisfied from your own mouth of what nature are the obligations you are under to him his actions sir his eyes have only made me think he designed to make me the partner of his heart the goodness and gentleness of his demeanour made me misinterpret all it was my own hope my own passion that deluded me he never made one amorous advance to me his large heart and bestowing hand have only helped the miserable nor know i why but from his mere delight in virtue that i have been his care and the object on which to indulge and please himself with pouring favours madam i know not why it is but i as well as you am methinks afraid of entering into the matter i came about but tis the same thing as if we had talked never so distinctly he ne'er shall have a daughter of mine if you say this from what you think of me you wrong yourself and him let not me miserable though i may be do injury to my benefactor no sir my treatment ought rather to reconcile you to his virtues if to bestow without a prospect of return if to delight in supporting what might perhaps be thought an object of desire with no other view than to be her guard against those who would not be so disinterested if this action sir can in a careful parent's eye commend him to a daughter give your sir give her to my honest generous bevil what have i to do but sigh and weep and rave run wild a lunatic in chains or hid in darkness mutter in distracted starts and broken accents my strange strange story take comfort madam all my comfort must be to expostulate in madness to relieve with frenzy my despair and shrieking to demand of fate why why was i born to such variety of sorrows if i have been the least occasion no twas heaven's high will i should be such to be plundered in my cradle tossed on the seas and even there an infant captive to lose my mother hear but of my father to be adopted lose my adopter 
then plunged again into worse calamities. An infant captive? Yet then to find the most charming of mankind, once more to set me free from what I thought the last distress, to load me with his services, his bounties, and his favors, to support my very life in a way that stole, at the same time, my very soul itself from me. But has young Bevel been this worthy man? Yet then again, this very man to take another, without leaving me the right, the pretense of easing my fond heart with tears. For, oh, I can't reproach him, though the same hand that raised me to this height now throws me down the precipice. Dear lady, oh, yet one moment's patience, my heart grows full with your affliction. But yet there's something in your story that— My portion here is bitterness and sorrow. Do not think so. Pray answer me. Does Bevel know your name and family? Alas, too well. Uh, could I be any other thing than what I am? I'll tear away all traces of my former self, my little ornaments, the remains of my first state, the hints of what I owed to have been. In her disorder she throws away a bracelet, which Selen takes up and looks earnestly on it. Ha! Oh, what's this? My eyes are not deceived. It is, it is the same, the very bracelet which I bequeathed to my wife at our last mournful parting. What said you, sir? Your wife? Whither does my fancy carry me? What means this unfelt motion at my heart? And yet again my fortune but deludes me, for if I are not, sir, your name is Silent. But my lost father's name was... Danvers, was it not? What new amazement! That is indeed my family. No, then, when my misfortunes drove me to the Indies, for reasons too tedious now to mention, I changed my name of Danvers into Sealand. Enter Isabella. If yet there wants an explanation of your wonder, examine well this face. Your sir, I well remember. Gaze on and read in me your sister, Isabella. My sister? But here's a claim more tender yet. Your Indiana, sir, your long-lost daughter. Oh, my child, my child. Oh, gracious heaven, is it possible? Do I embrace my father? And I do hold thee. These passions are too strong for utterance. Rise, rise, my child, and give my tears their way. Oh, my sister! Embracing her. Now, dearest niece, my groundless fears, my painful cares no more shall vex thee. If I have wronged thy noble lover with too much suspicion, my just concern for thee, I hope, will plead my pardon. Oh, make him, then, the full amends, and be yourself the messenger of joy. Fly this instant, tell him all these wondrous turns of providence in his favour. Tell him I have now a daughter to bestow, which he no longer will decline, that this day he still shall be a bridegroom, nor shall a fortune, the merit which his father seeks, be wanting. Tell him the reward of all his virtues waits on his acceptance. Exit Isabella. My dearest Indiana. Turns and embraces her. Have I then at last a father's sanction on my love, his bunch's hand to give, and make my heart a present worthy of Bevel's generosity? Oh, my child, how are our sorrows past, or paid by such a meeting? Though I have lost so many years of soft paternal dalliance with thee, yet in one day to find thee thus, and thus bestow thee in such perfect happiness, is ample, ample reparation. And yet again the merit of thy lover. Oh, had I spirits left to tell you of his actions, how strongly filial duty has suppressed his love, and how concealment still has doubled all his obligations, the pride, the joy of his alliance, sir, would warm your heart, as he has conquered mine. How laudable is love when born of virtue! 
I burn to embrace him. See, sir, my aunt already has succeeded and brought him to your wishes. Enter Isabella with Sir John Bevel, Bevel Jr., Mrs. Sealand, Simberton, Myrtle, and Lucinda. Sir John Bevel, entering. Where? Where is this scene of wonder? Mr. Sealand, I congratulate on this occasion our mutual happiness. Your good sister, sir, has, with the story of your daughter's fortune, filled us with surprise and joy. Now all exceptions are removed. My son has now avowed his love, and turned all former jealousies and doubts to approbation, and, I am told, your goodness has consented to reward him. If, sir, a fortune equal to his father's hopes can make this object worthy his acceptance. I hear your mention, sir, of fortune, with pleasure only as it may prove the means to reconcile the best of fathers to my love. Let him be provident, but let me be happy, my ever-destined, my acknowledged wife. Embracing Indiana. Wife! Oh, my ever-loved! My lord! My master! I congratulate myself, as well as you, that I had a son who could, under such disadvantages, discover your great merit. Oh, Sir John, how vain, how weak is human prudence! What care, what foresight, what imagination could contrive such blessed events to make our children happy as providence in one short hour has laid before us? Simberton to Mrs. Sealand. I am afraid, ma'am, Mr. Sealand is a little too busy for our affair. If you please, we'll take another opportunity. Let us have patience, sir. But we make Sir Geoffrey wait, ma'am. Oh, sir, I am not in haste. During this, Bevel Jr. presents Lucinda to Indiana. But here, here's our general benefactor excellent young man that could at once be a lover to her beauty and a parent to her virtue if you think that an obligation sir give me leave to overpay myself in the only instance that can now add to my felicity by begging you now to bestow this lady on mr myrtle she is his without reserve i beg he may be sent for mr simberton notwithstanding you never had my consent Yet there is, since I last saw you, another objection to your marriage with my daughter. I hope, sir, your lady has concealed nothing from me. Truth, sir, nothing but what was concealed from myself. Another daughter, who has an undoubted title to half my estate. How, Mr. Sealand? Why, then, if half Mrs. Lucinda's fortune is gone, you can't say that any of my estate is settled upon her. I was in treaty for the whole. But if that is not to be come at, to be sure there can be no bargain. Sir, I have nothing to do but take my leave of your good lady, my cousin, and beg pardon for the trouble I have given this old gentleman. That you have, Mr. Simberton, with all my heart. Myrtle discovers himself. Mr. Myrtle. 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 And I beg pardon of the whole company that I assume the person of Sir Geoffrey, only to be present at the danger of this lady being disposed of, and in her utmost exigence, to assert my rights to her, which, if her parents will ratify, as they once favoured my pretensions, no abatement of fortune shall lessen her value to me. Generous man. If, sir, you can overlook the injury of being in treaty with one who has meanly left her, as you have generously asserted your right in her, she is yours. Mr. Myrtle, though you have ever had my heart, yet now I find I love you more, because I bring you less. We have much more than we want, and I am glad any event has contributed to the discovery of our real inclinations to each other. Mrs. Sealand, aside. Well, however, I am glad the girl's disposed of, anyway. Myrtle, no longer rivals now, but brothers. 
dear Bevel, you were born to triumph over me. But now our competition ceases. I rejoice in the preeminence of your virtue, and your alliance adds charms to Lucinda. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have set the world a fair example. Your happiness is owing to your constancy and merit, and the several difficulties you have struggled with evidently show what e'er the generous mind itself denies, the secret care of providence supplies. Exeunt. Epilogue. Our author, whom entreaties cannot move, spite of the dear coquetry that you love, swears he'll not frustrate, so he plainly means, by a loose epilogue his decent scenes. Is it not, sirs, hard fate I meet to-day, to keep me rigid still beyond the play? And yet I'm saved a world of pains that way. I now can look, I now can move at ease, nor need I torture these poor limbs to please, nor with a hand or foot attempt surprise, nor rest my features, nor fatigue my eyes. Bless me, what freakish gambles have I played, what motions tried and wanton looks betrayed. Out of pure kindness all to overrule, the threatened hiss and screen some scribbling fool. With more respect I'm entertained to-night, our author thinks I can with ease delight. My artless looks, while modest graces arm, he says, I need but to appear in charm. A wife so formed by these examples bred, pours joy and gladness round the marriage bed, soft source of comfort, kind relief from care, and tis her least perfection to be fair, the nymph with Indiana's worth who vies, a nation will behold with Beville's eyes. End of Act 5 End of The Conscious Lovers by Richard Steele